If you go to Top Gun, you're not allowed to quote the movie. If you do, you're <laughs> fined. And I used, I, I looked for every opportunity I could to quote it. For six months, uh, like I said, I was in East Africa, primarily in uh, Djibouti. And then I look down and I see that people are shooting at me. Initially, it was fear, like, holy crap, I'm being shot at. And then it became like anger, like within a second, like, do you think you are shooting at yeah. me? We talk about a knife fight in a phone booth. Like we want to get in close with the guy, fight really slow and just slowly move your way into position to shoot him. You can maintain the offensive advantage unless you screw up. And so it's definitely a thinking game. When he does something, you have to think like, why is he doing that? Is he doing that to get me to screw up? And you're thinking like two turns ahead. There's not a competition. There's no trophy. The alternate isn't in the ladies room. Tactical call signs that we would use. No, no, you're a uh, personal one. Yeah. Oh, Farley. Farley. Yeah. Like Chris Farley. Oh, that's awesome. so many fucking moving parts with that yeah there is yeah. you know why it's called a sortie is that an acronym for something no, i don't know why no shit yeah uh, how do you not know that <laughs> i've never thought about it yeah yeah it's, uh, i always wondered what the fuck that meant but yeah or, or why it was called that i guess but uh the um from a, a bomb dropping standpoint um the very first combat mission that you were on the, yeah. like the very first bomb that you dropped what was that feeling like um, well, it was, it was, it was a pretty cool feeling. I'll tell you the very first, uh, mission I flew, one of the things that you do when you, when you check in, uh, to a combat area, uh, we call them fence in checks and that just makes sure you have all your weapon systems ready to go, all your defensive systems. And we flew with, uh, chaff and flares. So, uh, chaff is, is they're little bundles of metal shavings that would disrupt radar locks and then flares would be, uh, you know, decoys for infrared or heat-seeking missiles. And um, so we would fence in and we would do a chaff and flare check just to make sure that we're, um, you know, our systems are working before we flew into harm's way. And um, I put out chaff and I'm flying on night vision goggles and just bright flash. So um, obviously it was a flare that came out, not a chaff. They must have put it in the wrong bucket, but I'm thinking, so what happened? Like, what did I miss? You know, did, did somebody just shoot at me? And then I look down and I see that people are shooting at me and there's, you can see the flax, you know, uh, bursts in the air. And, and it was initially, it was just fear, like, holy crap, I'm being shot at. And then it became like anger, like within a second, like, who the fuck do you think you are shooting at yeah. me? Were, were they uh, like anti-aircraft or yeah. small arm? Yeah, they were anti-aircraft. Yeah. yeah. And, the, and the Iraqis were pretty... Um, uh, pretty hesitant uh, to shoot at us with any kind of guidance because they knew that we had, you know, uh, anti-radiation missiles that would home in on their radars. So they would, they they were afraid of us, which was was kind of fun uh, because you knew that they were not guiding missiles. They would just launch them up in there, big telephone poles, and hope to hit something, but they weren't guiding on you. Um, but we didn't know that at the time. Any close calls? Uh, not, not really. I mean, I, I did see several missiles launched at me, you know, uh, but nothing that I felt like imminent threat. Yeah. Um, so busy deployment. Yeah. Lots of close air support. Um, did you ever have the opportunity, uh, to follow up with any of the guys that you were talking to or is it always yeah. just total compartmentalized? Yeah, it was total compartmentalized. I mean, I'd, yeah. I'd love to know who some of these guys were, you know. Um, I have logs with their call signs and everything. Oh, no shit. Yeah. What was your call sign? Uh, it, it varied based on the ATO, their tasking order. My okay. fir very first call sign, you're talking about our tactical call signs that we would use? No, no, your uh, personal one? Yeah. Oh, Farley. Farley? Yeah, like Chris Farley. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> but, and, and do you pick it or does oh, it, get, no. it gets picked for it you? It gets picked for you. That's for everybody. Yeah. Yeah. And how, how, uh, like, how does that work? Uh, usually you do something stupid yeah, and, uh, and you'll get a call sign for that. Um, I knew a guy named Charmin because he, uh, he had to go to the bathroom in the jet and didn't have any toilet paper and, oh shit, you know, you guys shit in the jet. Well, you're not supposed to, but yeah, you gotta go, you gotta go. So how does that work? Uh, you safe up your ejection seat, you unstrap, basically strip out of everything and squat on the seat with a helmet bag underneath you. No shit. Yeah. Have you done that? No, no. Taking a piss? 
Oh yeah. yeah, yeah. We use like uh, pedal packs or like big Ziploc bags that have like the powder that turns into a Jello. Oh okay. And is that? I assume that's fairly common, right? Yeah, a lot of guys did it um, quite frequently. I rarely did it. Yeah, it was five six hours. I mean, yeah. Well, I mean, if during the daytime, if you're staying hydrated, that's kind of a long time to fucking hold it. Yeah, it is. Um, do you ever? Can you eat and drink up there, or do you? You, know, you can't really take your mask off, or you do? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. We we would all the time. Uh, we would you know always bring bottles of water. We flew with camelbacks in our in our survival gear, um, and then we would you know, cliff bars and, you know, whatever kind of uh, granola bars or snacks you like to eat. Um, we're not supposed to fly with our masks off, but they, now they're kind of learning that it's probably a good thing to actually take your mask off every now and then. Um, yeah, but we would, uh, as long as the cabin altitude is below 10,000 feet, you're not going to be worried about hypoxia or anything. Yeah. So we would take our masks off and eat and drink and just kind of take a breather. Yeah. It, what, uh, what's the max altitude that you can go, go at in an F-18? You know, I don't remember what the exact max is. I mean, I never flew uh, above 50. You never did? feet, yeah. yeah. You can, though, or it can? I, I, you know, I can't remember. Yeah. I, I think you, I think the. I think that might be the limit. The limit might be 50,000 feet. There is a certain altitude where you need to have, like, a space suit, and you need to have yeah. a bunch of different special yeah. physiological things. From a, an interior equipment standpoint, I mean, you're, you're setting the cabin pressure on the inside, right? No, it's uh, it's done automatically. Oh, really? Yeah, it's done automatically. So it's um, uh, d- depending on the model of the jet, um, it, it varied on how how it would uh, regulate. But basically, um, uh, it wasn't linear. So you'd start off at sea level; it'd be zero, and then by the time you got to uh, ten thousand feet of actual altitude, it might be at five thousand feet cabin pressure. Uh, but it wasn't linear. Um, and so once we were in the mid twenties, um, that's when the cabin pressure would be above 10,000 feet, it's supposed to have our mass on at that point. Um, is the, uh, is it just too, too hard on the equipment or too difficult to maintain south of 10,000 all the time in there? With- yeah, I think it's probably because, you know, the mission that we do, we're constantly moving up and down and, um, it would be hard for it to regulate that. Okay. Because I mean, I guess in a commercial jet, it's very different because you're it's so slow that right. you're going up and down. So you can just kind of set it at yep. ten thousand and leave it, and it stays there, yep. and it's not. Yeah, in commercial jets, it's the same way. We, I mean, we don't we don't set the pressure; oh, okay. it's set automatically. Is but it usually a, at ten thousand? It's about eight thousand. Okay, yeah. I know it fucks me up. You know, when I go from from here to to yeah. flying, I'm like, God damn, I can't hardly breathe in here. Yeah, my lungs are fucked up too, but uh, that's a whole other story. Um, what are the two key components for canine success? That's effective training and proper nutrition. Fueled by Team Dog brings those two components to your family and best friend. The perfect nutritional balance that results in a higher mental acuity, energy, overall vitality, and even an improved appearance. Every product you will find in my company's store was born from the battlefield and not from the boardroom. Let my life's work help you become your dog's hero. All right, so um, snacks and drinks. Did you ever bring like a fucking monster or anything like that, or it's always like bottles of water and? You know, uh, technically, uh, energy drinks were something that was not we were not allowed to to consume ever because um, they were afraid of how it would how our bodies would respond. Yeah. Um, um, which is funny because on that first cruise, they gave us what they called you know go pills and no go pills. Um, go pills were basically amphetamine. It was where they were given a speed. Um, is it like Vivance or Adderall or, or is it something even higher power it, than it, that? It was, it was literally speed. I mean, it was, um, it, yeah, uh, it was something that we had to take in a controlled environment to test it out with our flight surgeon watching us to see how he would respond before we could actually take it in the aircraft. And, um, I can't remember the name of what it actually was. We just called them go pills. And I flew with them uh, because if you know you're coming back dog tired after you know eight hours in the cockpit and you have to land on a carrier, you want to be a wor- a alert for it. But um, I quickly realized that I didn't do well because uh, I, I took it once landing on the carrier. I was almost falling asleep, so I took it and I was I could not focus on anything. I was like, oh look at that, you know, there's a, you know, <laughs> just shiny. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, but when we we had, when we took it to uh, to test out our reaction to it. Uh, we did it on a no-fly day, um, 
And usually, you, you know, death by PowerPoint on those days, somebody's going to brief you on some weapon system or something. And you're sitting in your ready room chair, trying to stay awake, drinking coffee, and it just drags on and on. And so we took these go pills and everyone was just sitting forward like, yeah, yeah, next slide, next slide, next slide, you know. I assume the no-go pills are like sleeping pills. It's pill. like Ambien, basically, yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's wild shit. Uh, what's the fucking most rule-breakingest thing you ever brought uh, on, on an F-18 with you? Um, well, tobacco wasn't allowed. Uh, and I, I chewed tobacco for a long time, so I obviously brought that with me. Yeah. Um, I had a wingman on my first cruise. He smoked. He smoked in the cockpit. Really? Yeah. How the fuck do you do that? That was what I wanted to know too. <laughs> I didn't know, but I looked over and I saw a glow in his canopy. So I got close and I, every few minutes would see him, you know, go like this and a little blossom of light. And then he looked over at me and he's like, get back out to spread. You know? So I flew back out to my position and later I asked him and he said, uh, he would ash in a little, uh, Altoid tin and, uh, he would, he would exhale the smoke in his oxygen mask and would, you know, pump it overboard. And No shit. Yeah. Dude, that's fucking nutty. The things you guys get away with. <laughs> um, all right, so you wrap that deployment up. Um, yeah. You go home. How how long in between the next several? Because yeah, did yeah, five. I did several. Um, that one, I, I was only home for um, a month, and then I I joined a squadron down in Beaufort, South Carolina. So I was single at the time, and um, the, the squadron was short on a guy, and they needed somebody, and. Um, their executive officer uh, called up to my squadron and asked uh, if I'd be willing to go down. So I moved to Beaufort, South Carolina, which was a Marine base. There were two Navy squadrons on the base. Um, and I immediately went back out on deployment. Back to Iraq? Uh, yeah, back to Iraq. We did Afghanistan on that one as well. We were on the Enterprise. Okay. Uh, same type of operational tempo most days? or You know, uh, same tempo, but uh, we didn't drop a single bomb. Because this was in the span from my first deployment to the second one, we had the whole mission accomplished thing. Oh yeah. And so now we transitioned to this peace time uh, posture where they wanted us to uh, uh, patrol pipelines in Iraq to make sure that their you know jihadis weren't trying to blow them up and ruin the infrastructure for the country. And uh, we did a lot of shows of force. We did a lot of CAS, um, a lot of close air support, but we never got the ROE to drop. Mm. All right, so with that deployment, um, kind of a, a low action deployment as far as combat goes, but uh, still obviously did a lot of uh, a lot of flights. Um, you come home from that, and then the third carrier deployment. Uh, what was that like? Yeah, so uh, we came back from that deployment, and um, uh, the Navy was testing out this thing where they they were calling it uh, the ability to pulse a carrier. And, and so the, the concept was that you would stay in a heightened state of readiness when you came back from deployment so that if they needed to surge you at the last, you know, just a short notice thing, you could do it. So uh, we actually did what they called a summer pulse. Uh, it was a two-monther uh, off the coast of uh, uh, off the UK. Uh, we flew over Scotland quite a bit. Um, uh, we did some stuff off Morocco, and, and we were just basically just proving that we could do it. It was all training, not combat. Um, came, came back from that one and, um, uh, it was funny. I had just, I had just gotten married and, um, my wife was going to the first wives club meeting and I was like, uh, babe, they lie. Like there's gonna be rumors. They lie. I don't trust anything here. And, uh, she came back and she said, you son of a bitch. They said, you're going on deployment. Yeah. <laughs> And I was like, well, no, we just got back. And I gave her all the reasons why that would never happen. No, no. We just got back from deployment. Um, we have to do this whole workup cycle again. We got to get new guys in, blah, blah, blah. I give the whole reason. Uh, go to the squadron the next day. And, and they said, did you hear? I'm like, hear what? <laughs> and um, uh, so there was a rumor that we were going to uh, deploy with a West Coast Air Wing aboard the Lincoln. There was a, a Marine Hornet squadron that wasn't ready to deploy and they needed to fill that gap. And they were going to use our squadron to do it. And, um, and that weekend I was going out to the tail hook convention, uh, which is for carrier aviators. It's a, it's an annual, uh, symposium. Uh, you, you talk about industry leaders and all the naval aviation uh, leadership from, you know, the air boss, which is the, the admiral in charge of all of naval aviations there. Um, and I ran into my CAG who's the air wing commander. And, and I said, sir, do you know what we're doing? And he said, uh, go ask the air boss. 
and he was right there talking to some people. And so uh, my buddy and I uh, were just dumb lieutenants. Um, you know, we're, we're hanging out with uh, beer bottles in each pocket in our flight suit and <laughs> rum and Coke in each hand and uh, walk up to the air boss. And he's got a group of people around him. And he, you can see him look at our patches and kind of, you know, you can see like a recognition in his eye. Like, I know what these guys want. So we waited till the, the gathering dispersed. And then he turned to us and he goes, uh, well, I guess you guys want to know what you're doing. And, and they're like, yes, sir, that'd be, that'd be nice. And he goes, well, pack your bags. My buddy goes, shit, sir, we haven't even unpacked yet. <laughs> Wow. So sure enough, we came back um, and uh, we were on deployment a month later. Wow. And where did you go for that? So that one, uh, so we, we uh, went from Beaufort, South Carolina, flew to uh, San Diego, uh, boarded the Abraham Lincoln, and uh, it was a Western Pacific. Um, basically, we were going to be there in case China decided to invade Taiwan. So most of our stuff was uh, was around the South China Sea. Um, we had port, port calls in Hawaii, uh, Hong Kong on Christmas. Um, and then this was, uh, I think this was 2005, there was a tsunami in Indonesia. And so it, it quickly shifted to humanitarian aid. So we, uh, left Hong Kong, went down, uh, off the coast of, um, Indonesia and, and did humanitarian aid, you know, delivering su- uh, supplies and medicine and water and stuff to the people there. Were you having, were you doing much at that point? I mean, so, um, as a jet pilot, no, um, we, we would send guys ashore to basically manage LZs. And, and so when helicopters would come in with supplies, they'd direct them, okay, you need to go to this LZ or that LZ, kind of a pseudo JTAC role, yeah. you know? Um, but basically it took all the, the pointy nose, all the tactical jets and put them in the hangar. And then the, the, the top of the flight deck was just for, you know, cargo planes and, and helicopters. And um, a lot of the helicopter pilots were getting wore out. I mean, they're just flying yeah. constantly. So I know there was a, He's actually a congressman now, um, Jake Elzey here in Texas. Um, he was a helicopter pilot in the Navy that became a Hornet pilot. And uh, he was a department head in one of the squadrons. And, and when the helicopter guys were getting worked to death, he basically volunteered to go fly a uh, second pilot. Oh, wow. Some of those missions. So That's badass. Um, could you fly a helicopter? No. I mean, yeah, it's like black magic and pixie yeah. dust or something. I don't know how <laughs> those things work. I mean, because the, the first... I know portion is the exact same, but yeah. for, like, I guess can, could a uh, could a helicopter fly? Could a helicopter pilot e- more easily fly a, a fixed wing than vice versa? I would think so, yeah. I, because um, I mean the principles of lift and drag and you know thrust and all that stuff is the same, but how it's generated is um, like I said through black magic for helicopters. So, yeah. um, but most helicopter pilots have some basic you know, fixed wing experience. So they know, um, and, and I have flown a helicopter simulator and I didn't die. So, yeah. so there's that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, I'm still, I guess, baffled by the fact that there's, you said like 30, 30 some F 18s on a, on a carrier yeah. at a time. Yeah. Um, I mean the, the, the aircraft carrier is, you know, the air wing on an aircraft carrier is larger than 70% of the nations of the world's air forces. Dude, that's nuts. Yeah. Holy shit. So what else is on there? Um, yeah, so you usually have four tactical squadrons that, you know, missile shooters, bomb droppers. So um, now with the F-35, uh, it kind of changes things up a little bit. But um, Hornets, Super Hornets, um, you know, F-35, uh, you have one or two helicopter squadrons. You've got an electronic attack squadron, which is now the uh, EA-18G Growler, replaced the Prowler. Um, it was a Super Hornet variant. Um, you've got um, uh, a C2 detachment, usually, which which are the cargo planes, and those are being replaced with a V22 tilt rotor variant. Um, and then you've got the E2 Hawkeye, which, you know, they're, they're uh, very underrated, but they're the most valuable thing we have because, you know, it's got that radar dish on top. And so, you know, when they, when they get airborne, I mean, they, they can look – uh, across the whole carrier strike group and, and they're, they're sending all their radar hits back to the carrier, back to the other jets that are flying and they can jam too, right? Um, I'd not, th- no, I don't think the E2 can jam. Um, but they, they can do a lot, um, in terms of data link. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so kind of the over horizon targeting type stuff. Yeah. Uh, the F 35, wh- what's the difference between an 18 and a 35? Is it, is it mostly technology or? Yeah, I'd say it's mostly technology. So the F 35 is a single engine. Um, 
I remember on my first deployment, we had a Lockheed guy come out and talk to us about why the F-35 was going to be this, this great thing. And, and we were, you know, two engine guys. We know if you lose an engine, you still have one more. And, um, so one of the guys brought up the concern, like, Hey, well, it's single engine. What, what happens when that engine, you know, quits on you? Um, and he goes, well, this jet's so advanced, it's going to tell you before it fails. Okay, but still. Yeah, and somebody's <laughs> like, is it going to tell you when you suck something in your intake on the catapult? You know, yeah. that's what we're worried about. <laughs> like, yeah. Um, but, uh, yeah, it's super advanced. Um, and that's, you know, my whole book, kind of get into that a little bit later. But um, it's um, it uses the cloud for a lot of stuff. Like, it, it's going to transmit maintenance data back to the base, you know, th- through the air um, so that they can have parts ready and everything. I mean, it's, it's this really high tech system, um, which, you know, is, means it's susceptible to being, a, you know, hacked. Yeah, it's like or, the Tesla of fucking fighter jets almost. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. 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 It's stealth. It's, and, it, and I've fought against them. And I, I will say that, you know, seeing them on radar is, you know, next to impossible. Oh, wow. Um, from a maneuverability standpoint, flyability in, in the, air combative space how does it stack up to the 18s is it more nimble faster or anything like that um no it's definitely not faster uh more nimble i i i still put the f-18 almost against anything uh, in terms of maneuverability um like the f-22 raptor the air force flies it has thrust vectoring so it can do some crazy maneuvers um but uh, the f-35 does not have that so it doesn't have that advantage um the f-18 is i mean is a incredibly maneuverable airplane uh, and we're taught to fight that like you know that we used to be talk about a knife fight in a phone booth like we want to get in close with the guy fight really slow and just slowly maneuver your way into position to shoot him um, the f-35 guys they treat it like i'm going to use my stealth to my advantage and i'm going to try to sneak around behind you and then club you in the back of the head yeah so that's what they do that's interesting. And the F-22 is the hybrid of everything? Yeah, yeah the F-22, I mean, they, the way the Air Force uses it, they are high altitude, long range, like we're going to shoot from a long ways away. But if they can get, you know, if they can get close, like if they have to get close, they can yeah. definitely. Yeah. Um, all right, so with that deployment, um, it, it turns into, uh, you know, mostly humanitarian stuff. Come home from that. Yeah. What, what's next? Came home from that, and um, I... Uh, went to be an instructor in Kingsville. So I was uh, one of the guys teaching brand new jet pilots, you know, in the T-45. Uh, one of my, because I'd done so many pl- deployments on the carrier, um, they made me the carrier qualification officer in charge. So like I was the guy that was every single boat detachment, I was flying out, you know, to the boat and, and uh, taking new students out there. So I, I got really good at teaching students how to land on the boat which is ironic since I was terrible at landing on the boat initially. <laughs> um, but I, I, you know, took, took pride in it. Um, several tail hooks. I had student, former students come up to me and say, I would never have survived if it wasn't for you. And so that was a really good feeling. That's um, awesome. And there's something really cool about seeing, you know, a scared student walking out to the jet, go land on the carrier. And then when he comes back, the swagger, you know what yeah. I mean? It's yeah. like night and day. Huge confidence. Boost. Yeah. Yeah. Were there any, I mean, that's a big opera, like op tempo change going from yeah. constant deployments and, and whatever to, to be an instructor. How did you handle that? Was it good for the family? It was, was, yeah, it was great. That's when I started having a family. So uh, I had my first son in Kingsville, um, got pregnant with, uh, with our second. Um, he wasn't born until my next assignment, but I, w- I went back to school and got a master's degree. Um, it was, so quality of life wise, it was great. How long were you there for? Uh, just under three years. So it was okay. a little over two. I, I, I left early because I wanted to get back into the F-18 and, um, an opportunity presented itself to be an admiral's aide for the reserve forces admiral out of New Orleans. And, uh, the reserves had a couple reserve F-18 squadrons. Uh, one of them was in New Orleans. And so, um, my, my boss, I worked for the Commodore, the, the air wing commander in, um, Kingsville. And he told me, Hey, uh, if you go take this admiral's aid job, they could probably let you be a guest pilot with the squadron in New Orleans. So that's what I did. We moved, uh, packed up from Kingsville, moved to New Orleans. I uh, was an admiral's aide for about a year. Uh, he got me current in the F-18, and and the admiral I worked for was fantastic. Every day, the squadron would call and say, hey, we got a bombing hop. You want to come? And I was, hey, admiral, uh, can I go fly? And he said, yeah, go for it. So, What do you do as an admiral's aide? 
anything the Admiral wants. And it depends. Anything? Yeah, I mean, yeah. <laughs> Cabin um, boy. Well, it's, it's, some Admirals were very, very needy. Um, mine was not. So, um, quick story. We went out to San Diego for an Admirals conference, and uh, it was uh, it was at the, uh, I think it was the BOQ or the, the Officers Club or something. It was right on the beach. And on one side was this big conference room where the, all the Admirals met, and the other side is where all the aides were. And I go sit in the room with the aides, and I'm, I'm looking around. Everyone's got their Blackberries out and laptops, and they're doing work. And I'm opening up a newspaper and reading, <laughs> feeling like something's wrong. And my phone rings, and it's the Admiral. And, you know, hey, Admiral, what can I do for you? And he said, Jack, go to the window. You know, I go to the window, and he's there on the other side of the you know, courtyard waving at me. He's like, what are you doing? I'm like, I'm just sitting here waiting for you. And he goes, go to the beach. I'm like, uh, yeah, Admiral, I'll just sit here with the other aides. He's like, I don't think you understand how this Admiral aid relationship works. Go to the beach. Like, aye, aye, sir. <laughs> so um, that's how that's how he was. I mean, yeah. he was he was great for yeah. quality of life. Um, when we had our second son, he was like, your wife needs you more than I do. So uh, just just call me every day. And after about a month, I was like, Admiral, I got to come back to work. You yeah. know, um, yeah, I can so, only wipe so much ass. Yeah, yeah. Uh, he was great. Yeah, I mean respectfully like I, I guess i just uh to me it seems like a huge waste to have a guy with your experience and knowledge doing something like that like couldn't you get a fucking e5 that got in trouble yeah you could and and i think um that may have been my perception too before i took the job but uh guys that go into those aid jobs are guys that uh, i think they're trying to groom for uh you know higher levels uh, within the Navy because you get exposed to a lot more. I went to the Pentagon with the Admiral. I got to see, sit in on staff meetings where the Chief of Naval Operations is talking to the Director of Navy staff on big, big issues. And so your awareness to what's going on, not just in your own little world tactically, but just in the Navy as a whole mm. is much greater. And so you have those connections. And and one of those connections actually played out um, several, several years later when I, I got deployed to Afghanistan. Oh, okay. Uh, so I guess mo moving forward, you do that for about a year, you said? Did that for a year. And then where after that? And then uh, and then I went to uh, VFA 204 in New Orleans. So I, I full-time active duty uh, went there. Um, it's a reserve squadron. And uh, at the time, the squadron was, they, um, they had what they called full-time support. I think now it's back to the original term, which was TAR, Temporary Active Reserve. It's basically your active duty assigned to a reserve unit. So you're the, the consistent person that's that's there while the reservists are actually out doing their civilian jobs you know flying okay. airliners and whatnot and so i went to be um you know one of those an fts and um i show up to the squadron and they immediately send me to top gun because uh, 204 uh was what we call an adversary squadron so we are the ones that like um uh, Jester and Viper and the original Top Gun, you know, the ones that, that train like the bad guys. So we, we go out and do that. So everyone who, who's in one of those squadrons goes to Top Gun as an adversary, learns how to employ, uh, you know, your the F-18 like a MiG, like a Sukhoi. Uh, we know the tactics of how the Chinese fight, how the Russians fight. And, um, and so I went through a pretty in-depth training syllabus inside the squadron and then went to Top Gun um, to, as an adversary and then uh, came back and um, immediately told, got told, all that stuff we taught you, you're not going to use. We're going to send you to Afghanistan. So. We all have busy lives these days and can't afford to waste a day stuck on the couch because of a few drinks the night before. Z-Biotics pre-alcohol is the answer we've all been looking for. How do you use it? Step one, have a Z-Biotics. For the best result, make Z-Biotics your first drink of the night. Step two, drink responsibly. Pace yourself, hydrate, and get a good night's sleep. Step three, enjoy tomorrow. Wake up feeling refreshed and ready to take on the day. Z-Biotics pre-alcohol probiotic drink is the world's first genetically engineered probiotic. It was invented by PhD scientists to tackle rough mornings after drinking. Here's how it works. When you drink, alcohol gets converted into a toxic byproduct in the gut. It's this byproduct, not dehydration, that's to blame for your rough next day. Zbiotics pre-alcohol probiotic produces an enzyme to break this byproduct down. Just remember to make Zbiotics pre-alcohol your first drink of the night. Drink responsibly, and you'll feel your best tomorrow. I don't drink a lot. Uh, in fact, I rarely do it. It's usually a special occasion. Uh, 
because of that, it usually affects me pretty negatively with the exception of using this. And this is why I, I'm a big fan of this product. If I got family coming into town for Christmas, et cetera, I, I like to have a, a few drinks with them. What I don't like is how it makes me feel. Uh, Z-Biotics has managed to save my ass more than once as far as that goes. And I can't recommend this stuff enough. Uh, this holiday season, give your friends and family a gift they will actually want to use with Zbiotics. Go to zbiotics.com forward slash mic drop, all caps, all one word, to get 15% off your first order when you use mic drop at checkout. Zbiotics is backed with a 100% money back guarantee. So if you're unsatisfied for any reason, they'll refund your money, no questions asked. Remember, head to zbiotics.com slash mic drop and use the code mic drop at checkout for 15% off. I want to thank Zbiotics for sponsoring this episode and our good times. Oh shit! So going back to Top Gun, what was that like? I mean, having grown up seeing the yeah. movie and like, I mean, it was awesome. You know, um, if you go to Top Gun, you're not allowed to quote the movie. If you do, you're <laughs> fined. And I used I I looked for every opportunity I could to quote it. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I remember fighting the the skipper one day, and uh, I was just quoting movies nonstop. And he was like, Farley, would you shut the fuck up? <laughs> Wait, I mean, is it, uh, it was at Miramar then, I assume? No, it was in Fallon, Nevada. Oh, okay. Yeah, Miramar became a Marine Corps air station, and they, they moved uh, Top Gun up to Fallon. Oh, okay. Uh, how long were you there for? Uh, it was about uh, two months. Two months? Yeah. And from your perspective of being an adversary there going against our guys, how did, I mean, were you kicking, kicking their ass, or how was it shaking out? Well, you know, we had a... Um, uh, kind of a cooperate to graduate mentality because it was, I was an adversary student and I'd be going against av- uh, uh, fighter students. And, and so um, every day the, the adversary lead would brief the whole event. And so I would stand up in, in the auditorium in front of everybody. And this is no joke. One of the things they teach you is how to have music playing and then how to fade the music out in time exactly as your watch hits, you know, brief time. And then you start the brief the same way. Uh, so there's, that, that was a big lesson, like how to turn that volume knob, you know, just to get the music to fade out. Why? Um, I don't know. They just wanted everything to be done the exact same way. Like when you erase on a board, you would race uh, up and down, not side to side. Because if you race side to side, your butt shakes. But if up and down, your butt doesn't shake. <laughs> Dude, that's fucking weird. Yeah. Like yeah. they're that specific about it. Very specific. Wow. Yeah. Um, because you're... you're you're, when you go to Top Gun, you're being trained how to be an instructor, how to be an effective instructor, and and when you when you're wearing that patch, you're you're a, an expert. People come to you and they ask you a question, and you're expected to know the answer, and you're expected to if you don't know the answer to get the answer to them, and uh, and they want you to to everyone to be instructing the same way across the, the fleet. Yeah. Um. So there's a value in it, uh, but it also teaches you how to be very detail oriented and. Yeah. 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 Um, the actual dog fighting air combatives in the air type stuff. Um, can you kind of explain what that's like? Um, yeah. Um, so every, like I said, everything is a crawl, walk, run process. So the very basic dog fighting is one V one, uh, just one good guy, one bad guy. And you, um, you're either starting off offensive where you have a distinct offensive advantage or you're starting off defensive opposite or we call it what's called a high aspect and that's where you are pointing beak to beak completely neutral and um the the uh the biggest takeaway on um the offensive or defensive is that you're really relying on the other guy to make a mistake um so if you for instance you're offensive um you can maintain the offensive advantage unless you screw up. And so that's what they're trying to do is they're trying to get you to screw up. They're trying to get you to overshoot. And so it's definitely a thinking game. When he does something, you have to think like, why is he doing that? Is he doing that to get me to screw up? And you're thinking like two turns ahead. Um, so so there's the there's a thinking aspect of it. And then there's the pulling G's aspect of it, which puts everything you know in a whole different environment. Um, because you go from, you know, like we're sitting here pulling one G right to seven and a half G. So now your head, you know, is, is suddenly eight times as heavy and you're trying to turn and you're trying to look over your shoulder and, and, and all that force is pushing down on you. And, um, it's, it's a really exhausting thing. Um, 
uh, that's why we we wear G suits to try to inflate, you know, around to push the blood up to keep it up in our head. That's why we we have different uh, breathing ways of breathing and tightening our muscles to try to keep the blood in our head because, you know, there's so many times when I've been fighting and, and your vision just whoosh, we call it a soda straw, which just gets real narrow and you just can't see anything and. Um, yeah. Are, are there mechanisms in place where, uh, if you pull too many G's for too long and you fucking pass out that the the plane goes into autopilot or are you just fucking shit out of luck? Yeah. I mean, uh, at the time there wasn't, um, as I was leaving the F-18, they actually did come up with a system. They call it the, um, collision, ground collision avoidance system or something where it would do that, where it would alert you like, Hey, you're about ready to hit the ground. And if you didn't do anything, it would take over and, and, uh, and fly away from the ground. But um, I've lost a ton of friends, you know, that have done that and, and crashed into the ground and died. So I assume then it's pretty much all on you to regulate your own ability to, yeah. you know. So I guess in, in a scenario where that's starting to happen, do you have the wherewithal to, to I don't know, relax or release or yeah, lower? Yeah, you do. You do. And, and um, before every training air to air training engagement we do we call it we do what's called a g warm and that's to basically get a feel for how we're doing that day because you know maybe i didn't get a lot of sleep last night or drink too much coffee this morning or whatever and um so we do this g warm it's it's uh, a 90 degree turn at four g's and then a 90 degree turn uh pulling to six and then easing off to four and so you kind of get a feel like okay uh, i'm a little bit weak today so i might need to you know be quicker on my anti-g straining yeah. maneuver or whatever but if you if you're pulling and you see that soda straw you can kind of relax the pull but then you might be giving up a tactical advantage and so i assume ego plays a big fucking role yeah. in in guys not leveling out and yeah. whatever yeah. yeah no nobody wants to cry uncle and say oh, dude i can't do it today yeah is seven and a half the most you've ever done seven and a half well i mean i pulled more than that but a, a seven and a half is the maximum that the jet is supposed to be able to pull but you can overstress it is, is there a point at which you could stress it to where it would fuck the air, like the airplane would break apart or something? Not, or? No, not to that level. I mean, after seven and a half G's, they have to do an inspection on it. But, uh, yeah. but no, it's, you, you were never going to pull so much that the wings fall off yeah. or anything. How much of the, the G4 simulator stuff is, is done in training? So you go through the centrifuge once, um, and that's the, you know, they, they strap you in and it just thing just spins around and uses centrifugal force. And, um, you go through it once and it's really just to get a feel. It's like, yeah, I've never really pulled G's, that many G's before. So now I'm going to see how I, uh, how I behave. And it, they essentially try to, you know, get you to black out. Um, they have you looking over shoulder. They have you, um, uh, maybe, maybe not pulling, not doing the straining maneuver right away. Um, and they video it. I don't even know if I still have the video, but you can see you know, yeah. your face is just being pulled down and, um, and, uh, they show us every year when we go back, you know, they, they show us videos of guys that black out and they'll be they black out for maybe five seconds and they, they wake up and they had a whole dream, you know? Oh, wow. Um, just, it, it happens real quick. Yeah. Yeah. Man, that's fucking nutty. Is, is, uh, I, I assume that blacking out from G force is no different than like a blood choke in jujitsu yeah. where, I mean, it's not good for you. Right. And the more you do it, the more susceptible you are to it. Right. To a certain extent, I, yeah, I would think so. Um, the um, I think they, they do say if if people if you do have what they call a G lock, a G induced loss of consciousness, that you are more likely to have it. Um, th they started getting smarter with it. The Navy started getting smarter with it, um, not with just with that, but also we would have other um, altitude related things. Um, I have hypoxia or. Um, or different uh, pressure, you know, like our, our cabin pressure would fluctuate and we'd get, um, like you would in diving, you'd have central nervous system hits. We'd get, you know, guys would get the bends. Um, so we, 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 they've gotten smarter with it. When the last uh, several years we were flying with, they called slam sticks. We'd just keep them in our flight suit. And when you come back, you would download the data and they could see what the cabin pressure was to see if you had any of those hits. Yeah. Um, because they're finding that that's like, you know, TBI, it's traumatic yeah. brain injury. And the more you, more it happens to you, the more susceptible you yeah. are. And yeah, it's like concussions. Yeah. And else. Yeah. yeah. Um, man, that's fascinating. The, uh, with the top gun school, the, the students that are there, they're there to just become instructors. Yes. Okay. So it's not, 
I guess the way it's kind of portrayed in the movie is different. Yes. Uh, yeah. That's one of the things that there's not a competition. There's no trophy. The alternate isn't in the ladies room, you know, uh, <laughs> I wish it was, but yeah. that's not the way it is. Um, so that's why I said it's a cooperate to graduate kind of mentality. So, you know, as I was doing those mass briefs, um, I would call on a fighter to to give the threat of the day. They have to give it stand up and say, you know, here's this missile and this is where it's carried or whatever. Um, I never wanted to surprise them. So I told all the fighters, hey, when I'm briefing, I'm going to put my kneeboard card, which has my whole plan for the fight, like what the, what the bad guys are going to do as well as who I'm going to call on, I'm going to put it in my box. And so if they wanted to, they could go look at it and they could say, okay, this, you know, he's going to call on me. Yeah. And um, so most of them weren't surprised, but there was one day, you know, I call on a guy and he obviously wasn't prepared. And, you know, and I, I see him like looking down at his hand where he'd written, you know, <laughs> cheat sheet about like, okay, the SAN six is carried on the, uh, on this ship. And, yeah. and I see all the instructors in the back with their pens and they just start taking notes. <laughs> <laughs> What, uh, what was kind of the coolest thing or biggest takeaway from being at Top Gun? Um, man, the, the flying uh, was was awesome. I mean, Fallon's in the middle of nowhere, but it's got a bunch of mountain ranges and it's desert in between. And so we own the airspace from basically the floor all the way up to, you know, 50,000 feet. Um, and it was uh, your only job was to fly, you know. So that was the coolest thing. Um, is, uh, you know, you, you go do this big war where you were, I'm controlling maybe 10 or 12 adversary aircraft, trying to defend the motherland against, you know, these imperialist aggressors and, and these four, you know, F-18 Super Hornets are, are trying to attack a target. And, and, um, it was just, it was amazing. I mean, yeah. the flying was incredible. You, once you die, you would, uh, we call it killer moving. And you would just uh, go right to the desert floor and just right over the ground, and you just low level across all these mountains, yeah, back to the starting spot. Yeah, that's cool. What's the top speed of uh, of an F eighteen? Uh, it's listed at Mach one point eight, which um, how many miles per hour is that? I don't know. Is that fifteen hundred miles an hour or so? Is it? That's fast as fuck. Yeah, it's fast. <laughs> yeah. And uh, do you know what the what the max range would be? I know it, it varies on payload, but let's say yeah. you're totally stripped down, full of fuel. Yeah, uh, with we usually would fly with one external tank, and we, we kind of uh, plan that at eight hundred miles. Uh, with a that's a fuel conserving mindset. Oh, okay. You know, not it, flying real fast. I assume dog fighting is burning gas. Like yeah, a son of a bitch. Oh yeah, you could be out in thirty minutes. Yeah, yeah, that's cool shit. Um, <clears throat> the uh, so from there you finish that, and then you go where? Went back to uh, two hundred four, back to my squadron, and. Um, just started doing the adversary thing you know we would uh, uh we would go to jacksonville florida san diego california and just you know playing the red air for other squadrons getting ready to deploy so when they're on their comp 2x's and they're flying off the carrier so like off san diego they would they would take off and go try to bomb san clemente and and we'd be holding overhead san clemente trying to defend you know yeah yeah uh one question i meant to ask you about the top gun stuff is, i guess or specifically like the really Hardcore, intense dogfighting stuff. Yeah. Uh, do you ever get dizzy and like vertigo when you're doing all these banking maneuvers? And no, shit? And, and that's the funny thing. Um, when I'm dogfighting, I'm I never get like that. Like I I could be upside down, twisting, turning. Um, as long as I'm focused on another guy, I'm fine. But if you take that away and you just have me do loops and rolls and stuff, I'll I'll get dizzy. Really? Yeah. I I don't know if it's just because I'm focused on something, but I can't stand aerobatics. I can't stand just normal loops and rolls. Yeah. What would it take to get you to barrel roll a 737? Oh, I could do it pretty easily. I mean, like with Once. passengers on it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if I can retirement. Man, they'd <laughs> throw me in jail for that probably. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's wild shit. Um, all right, so you, you go back to the squad and you're getting other groups ready. Mm -hmm. uh, what was your next deployment? So um, the Navy was doing what they called individual augmentees. And they were taking guys that um, had a certain skill set and plugging them into positions, you know, Iraq, Afghanistan, wherever, um, to fit a need. Because now, obviously, the war had been going on for you know quite some time, and um, and so in Afghanistan, um, we were finding that uh, Navy aircraft weren't going kinetic, weren't dropping bombs as much as the Air Force, and they were trying to figure out why. 
And so there was uh, some brainchild in the Pentagon, 05 probably, decided, hey, uh, the Army just doesn't know how to use Navy TAC Air, so let's take 10 TAC Air guys, stick them in tactical air control parties and all over Afghanistan, and we'll, we'll see that good number go up. So that's what they did. They, they picked 10 of us. Um, I was one of them. Um, and, you know, we go through the, the Air Force Joint Firepower course, learn about, you know, joint doctrine and close air support and how it's all working. And, and uh, the Navy was telling us that we're going to be what they called air planners, okay, which is nowhere in joint doctrine. And so we talked to the colonel that was going to take control of us in, in country, and he said, what's an air planner? I'm like, I have no idea. And he goes, well, uh, I'm going to use you like air liaison officers, which is what the uh, the Air Force um, calls like the, the the officers in charge of the JTACs and a tactical air control party. And we're like, sure, sounds good to me. So um, so we go through Fort Jackson, South Carolina, go through uh, Army training where they, you know, we shoot M4s and, uh, you know, M9s and learn how to drive in Humvees and do rollover training and, you know, just basic Army stuff. And um, we're getting ready to get on the rotator to fly to Kuwait. And um, they, they say, hey, we need to take your M4s back. And we're like, what are you talking about? I'm not giving you my M4. And uh, they said, yeah, yeah, it's a mistake. You guys are going to be on a staff. You don't need it. And we're like, no, the colonel says we're going to be going out to FOBs and stuff. Like, I'm, you know, I need my M4. And, um, and so they, you know, I get on the phone with this, uh, I think he was lieutenant commander, uh, back at the Pentagon on the Navy staff. And he's like, look, Lieutenant, you have your orders, you know, get on that plane. And I'm like, I'm not going anywhere without a rifle. And so that's where, you know, being an Admiral's aide came in handy. I knew an Admiral on the Navy staff called him and I said, Admiral, they're trying to take our rifles away. Um, the Air Force Colonel saying, you're, we're going to put you on a, on a helicopter and send you out to a FOB. Um, I don't feel comfortable going without a rifle. And he goes, I'll take care of it, Jack. You know, and the next day I get a phone call from this, Lieutenant commander who starts screaming, did you go to an admiral? I'm like, you're damn right I did. You know, so um, bottom line is they we, we went without rifles. Um, and the, the Air Force said, we'll give you some when you get here. And they did. And then a few months later, the Navy um, the Navy ended up giving us rifles. Jesus. I mean, the fact that you even have to fucking fight for that is right. absurd. Right. You know? But um, when you got there, did you did you hit the ground running? when you got there uh, it was it was pretty slow initially we we flew into bagram um and we were there for a couple of days and then we kind of uh uh different guys went to different fobs and so uh, some of us went down to kandahar and then uh went out to different other camps uh, around there um so i was with the fourth brigade combat team 82nd airborne and um i spent most of my time in herat um living in a tent with you know jtax and um and I, I basically was the the air guy. So anytime the the ground force commander was planning an operation, he would, hey, what do we have available? And I'd tell him, hey, give me the list. We got a you know B one. We got two F 15s We got, you know, the F fifteens have forty five minutes on station time. The F sixteens have an hour. Uh, F eighteens have twenty minutes. And he goes, well, who would you use? I'm like, not the F eighteens. I mean, I'm not going to take somebody that only has twenty minutes of on station time. And so, you know, I think the Navy figured out real quick that their whole plan was flawed. Yeah. But that had to have been um, a good learning experience for you, too, though, right? Being mm -hmm. on the ground. And, oh, yeah. Uh, I'm surprised that it took them that long to, to do that. Yeah. I mean, yeah. the Marine Corps does that. All the Marine pilots do a fact tour. You know, they go with the uh, ground unit and, uh, and see what the war's like from the other side. Yeah. But, you know, the Navy doesn't do that. So I was very fortunate to have that experience. Yeah. Uh, any close calls or any, any crazy shit happen when you're on the ground there? Uh, our fob got overrun. Uh, they drove a VBIED through the main gate and, um, a uh, bunch of insurgents poured onto the compound, uh, while I was there. But, uh, I had just come back from deployment since where I was sleeping under, you know, catapults and stuff. So I slept right through it. Oh, no shit. Uh, I woke up when my JTACs came back into the tent, throwing their rifles and body armor down and high-fiving each other. I'm like, what did we miss? No shit. Yeah. Wow. Like you didn't even wake up. No, I didn't wake up. Wow. That's fucking wild. Um, how long was that deployment? So it was it was a year. I ended up doing about six months um, because I was um, leaving the Navy active duty. Um, and so I had to be back. And it was, it was one of those where uh, I needed to find a civilian job. And um, 
uh, the Navy said, we're just going to leave you there until your active time is up. And I'm like, I have a family. I have to have a job. And so the Air Force hooked me up. The colonel, you know, called the Navy admiral that was in charge and said, I don't care what you do with them, but I'm getting them out of Afghanistan. So he put me on a plane, sent me home, and um, I went back to the squadron that I came from, switched over to the reserves immediately, and then just went back to doing the same mission. Yeah. Um, so that was your TACP deployment, I assume. Yeah. Right? The JSOC deployment. Yeah. Uh, when was that? Uh, that was, uh, so, you, so the, the Afghanistan was 2010, 2015 was the JSOC one. Um, so this is, you've been in the reserves for several years. Yeah. And were you uh, a commercial pilot? I was, yeah. So doing both? Uh, no, just um, I, I became a commercial pilot or I started working for Southwest in uh, 2014. Oh, okay. So for from 2010 to 2014, you were doing reservist. Yeah, I was uh, mostly a reservist. I did work for a, a marine engineering company uh, doing offshore and undersea construction projects, a lot for the Navy, some for um, oil and gas companies in Louisiana. And that was your main gig? That was my main gig. Yeah. And doing the reserve stuff as a reservist. Yeah, that yeah. was, you know, 10 days a month. Yeah. So what was the transition for, well, so in 2014, you landed a gig with Southwest. Yep. Was that at all difficult or was it just like you drop a resume and it, it took me about a year. Um, airlines weren't really hiring that much at the time. So it took me about a year. I had to actually go get a type rating in a 737 out of, you know, paid my, out of my own pocket to do that. Um, but then I got that job. Um, cause I, I mean, the marine engineering job was great. I was a project manager, um, which is what my master's degree was in. So I thought I wanted to do it. And then I realized I didn't want to work for a living, Yeah, you know, and being a pilot was way more fun. So that's when I applied to all the airlines and Southwest was the one that called. Yeah. Wow. Um, when you started there, was it a big, big culture shock? I know there's a lot of, a lot of pilots are former military. So I mean, yeah. was it my, my class was, uh, predominantly a former military. Yeah. Um, it's shifted now. Now it's probably more civilian. Really? Yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, is it true that uh, you can tell by the way a pilot lands a commercial <laughs> air, aircraft if it's two, two at once versus one and then one? Yeah. Is, uh, that, is there any validity to that? Uh, it's the joke. You know, it's yeah. it's definitely definitely the joke. Um, I, I've had I uh, flew with an Air Force guy. It was his landing actually, and it was a rough landing and. Uh, some passengers stuck his head up and said, who's the Navy pilot? He points at me. And I was like, yeah, but it was your landing. Yeah. So, <laughs> so there's no, that's a total fucking old wives. Yeah. Tale. Yeah. Uh, so what, what is the, is there a, a theory or a, a strategy behind landing is, is the goal to hit both at the same time? And just sometimes you can't, I, I actually try to land on one main first because uh, of the way the speed brakes deploy. So it's usually a smoother landing for me. Okay. So it's more pilot preference. Yeah. yeah. Um, all right. So you're working for Southwest for about a year and then 2015, did you get reactivated? Or? Yeah. So what happened was, um, you know, for the, the, the four or five years in between, uh, our squadron was kind of exempt from sending guys on IAs because we were doing the adversary job and it was so important for getting guys ready to deploy. And the new air boss said that, um, yeah, that's no longer the case. Now somebody from your squadron is going to have to go. And uh, RCO came to, there was a group of five of us, and he basically said, you five are eligible, figure out who's going to go. You know, try and tell five reservists, you know, who have lives outside of the Navy uh, that you're going to have to go spend some time downrange. Um, of course, no one stepped up and was like, yeah, it's going to be me. And um, uh, the others... Um, I think three of the other four were eligible to retire. And they said, that's it. I'll just retire. I'm not going to go. The other guy was pretty senior at FedEx making a ton of money. He's like, I'll just quit. And, uh, I hadn't re met the window to retire yet. And, um, I was still pretty new in my first year at Southwest. So I wasn't making a lot of money and I was like, well, crap, like I can't quit. I can't retire. <laughs> I guess it's going to be me. So I started looking for a job. I figured instead of getting told I'm going to go somewhere. I'm going to look for one. And so I found, um, six months, um, in uh, Germany and, uh, it was on, on air staff and I was like, perfect. I'm going to sign up for that. So I told my skipper I'm volunteering and he said, great, that, you know, that'd be awesome. And, um, and quickly found out, um, when I was in Fort Jackson, again, going through the whole army training to, to go to Germany, I got a call from a guy at Fort Bragg and he said, uh, 
hey, I saw that you're JTAC and uh, you did this thing in Afghanistan and we got a guy in East Africa that's having a baby. We could really use you there. So we'll send you there for six months and then we'll bring you back to to North Carolina for a little bit and then we'll send you to North Africa. And I was like, wait, uh, I was planning on having my whole family come with me to Germany. It was going to be a vacation, you know. And uh, so I was like, okay, roger that, sir. Um, so I was kind of surprised, you know, six months in Germany turned into a year in Africa. Damn. <laughs> But uh, that's good for the family, right? Yeah. Holy shit. Was yeah. your wife super pissed? I mean, she wasn't pissed at the time, but it yeah. created a lot of tension afterwards. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Afterwards? When I came back, I mean, it was it was really more my experience, you know, downrange and what I went through that uh, affected how I yeah. uh, responded at home. I got you. Uh, what can you tell us? I know that the JSOC mission is a little, a little more sensitive, but... Yeah. Uh, of what you can share for that that year doing that, uh, please, if, if you would. Yeah. Um, so for six months, I, like I said, I was in East Africa, primarily in uh, Djibouti. Uh, I was working for the Joint Special Operations Air Detachment. And basically what that meant is um, I was uh, responsible for logistics, uh, ISR, fires, uh, anything that the, uh, the task force needed to support the mission uh, on the Horn of Africa. You know, I was, I was going to get them. So... Um, you know, that, whether that be, uh, you know, for instance, we had some, I'll just say we had some SEALs that were, were doing an operation and their plan was to ground and fill. Um, and every day they were coming under fire. Uh, they were basically being ambushed and they were with a partner force. Uh, they were being ambushed every single day. And so we had to use our drones to do essentially close air support with them. We eventually managed to get some uh, Harriers um, that we stole off of an amphib that was transiting through the Gulf of Oman and some, uh, some in-flight refuelers that came over from CENTCOM and so that we could ha- actually have close air support for them. Um, we had to emergency airdrop supplies, ammo, you know, rippets was a big one. You got to have rippets. Um, and they, they get to the objective, and their plan was to ground exfil out. And uh, they said, no, we're not, we're not doing this. We, we need to be flown out. And so there was an old uh, dirt strip there, and uh, they had an Air Force combat controller with them. He did a whole survey, and so I ran the survey up, you know, through the Air Force to get it approved for a C-130, and uh, I went to the the Air Force colonel who owned the C-130s in the Horn of Africa, and I said, um, you know, here's here's all your intel. Here's here's where the threats are. Here's what we're going to have available, and I need you to you know fly a C-130 in and get these ten Americans and two trucks out and. Uh, he looked me in the eye and he said, no, I'm not going to risk my career over that. Really? And I lost my mind. I mean, again, I'm an airline pilot. I'm a reservist. Uh, fire me. I don't care. And so I, I went off on him. Uh, my boss was the Air Force Lieutenant Colonel. And he kind of put his hand on my shoulder and he calmed down there. And uh, I was like, you know what? Screw it. I'm going to do it myself. And I walked out. Um, there was an MC-130 uh, unit that was just there, happened to be there. For another reason, I went to their officer in charge and I gave him the same brief. I said, can you do this for me? And he said, he said, yeah, I'll do it for you. And uh, so they went and did the mission. Um, I had, a, you know, I had drones and some other aircraft overhead taking imagery. And I, I took some pretty cool still shots, put it in a one sheet, you know, little PowerPoint thing that I sent to the, the colonel that told me no. And I just sent it to him and I said, thanks for nothing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's fucking, I can't, I mean, I, it's hard to to fathom that taking place. Yeah, uh, in it, that, it in blew that me away. Yeah. It blew me away. Yeah. Um. So in in that environment, it sounds like you were kind of more of a of a an air ops boss kind of yeah coordinator. Yeah. Uh, did you do any flying on that deployment? I did, no, I did not fly. I did get to go fly. Um. I uh, pretty much any any unit that was there, they would always say, "Hey, do you want to go flying with us?" And yeah. Uh, there was a CV-22 uh, Air Force Osprey debt um, that was there, and they were always doing missions, and, hey, come with us. Um, so it was, it was a really, really good experience. Um, you know, it was a really good experience getting to see um, kind of the forward-leaning nature of some of the people that I was working with. Yeah. And um, the ground force commander uh, on one of actually that mission that I just talked to you about, um, a guy named Ryan, that he ended up, um, he ended up passing away in uh, in Yemen. The mission mm. uh, it was one that Trump authorized right after he was um, elected. And I, I remember distinctly uh, talking to some of my friends from back home, you know, in Seattle, and and they were uh, 
they were saying, you know, Trump got that guy killed. And I'm like, dude, like, I, I remember Ryan. Like, that dude was so forward leaning. He was like, what can we do? Give me a gunship. Give me this. Give me that. Like, I want to do this. And, um, and no, I, like, those guys wanted to do operations. They wanted to take the fight to the enemy. And it was nice that we actually had a president that was willing to, yeah. you know, yeah. to say, yeah, go do it. Yeah, no doubt. Um, so you spent a year coordinating all that shit and yeah. supporting the JSOC. Mission. Yeah, six six months in um, in East Africa. Uh, came back to Fort Bragg for a little bit, and then um, and then went did finally go to Germany to do stuff in North Africa, and um, and that was when uh, we were doing a lot of stuff in uh, Libya. Just starting to go back in Libya. Yeah. Anything you can share? I know you got to be a little vague with that, but yeah, uh, the vague. Um, there. Uh, <laughs> so I will say, um, it was right after, you know, it was right after we were going back into Libya after the whole Benghazi debacle and, um, the French and the British and Americans were there. Um, we had, um, uh, intelligence types there. We had soft forces there, but there weren't many of them at the time. I think we maybe had 10 Americans, um, and none of the countries were talking to each other. You know, so the Brits didn't know where the French were, didn't know where the Americans were. And so uh, when I was there, they, they said, hey, we're going to go have a conference in Paris. And we're going to all sit down and we're going to figure out, you know, where our people are so that we don't have fratricide or any of this stuff. And it makes perfect sense. And uh, so they asked me to go along because we were sending C-130s down there all the time and uh, empty pallet positions. And, and um uh, we figured we could take some French stuff or the French would send stuff down. We could take some of our stuff. And so, uh, so we traveled to Paris and I went to this conference. Um, and I, I distinctly remember, um, when all the senior officers were in the room and they were, they were yelling at each other, like, I'm not going to tell you where my people are. And the French and the British really hate each other. And, um, the minute they left and it was just like the war fighters were like, okay, bro, here's where we are. They pulled out a map and started drawing on it. <laughs> and uh, it was, it, that was my takeaway on a whole deployment was that like you had the senior officers, senior leaders were, carry, were caring more about um, the political implications. Yeah. And then you had the ones that were actually doing the work that cared about the mission. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Um, that was, uh, it was interesting. Yeah. Yeah. I know it. It's, uh, it's unfortunate the amount of, politics and uh bucking for promotion that goes into yeah. the upper echelons of, of our military and government it's it's heartbreaking you know um i think the, the older you get and the more experienced you are in the military or, or in any type of government capacity the more you see behind the curtain and the more disenfranchised yeah. you become with uh with how our country is yep. unfortunately yep. but um <clears throat> so it was a, a solid year you came home that, that was the last of your either reservist or active duty deployment yeah, time, stuff like that. And then from, from then until present day, it's all working for Southwest and becoming uh, an author, right? Yeah. I uh, retired from the Navy last year. Oh, cool. Uh, so I did uh, keep flying in the reserves for a while. Um, uh, finished out 23 years oh, nice. uh, last year and retired. Uh, but it's been, yeah, all Southwest since yeah. then. Do you have an F-18 coin that we can put in the, uh, um, I do have a coin that I, I, I'm going to get you, but it's right. a special one for this book. And when, oh, sweet. when, when the release comes out, you're oh, going to cool. get something. Awesome. Uh, I have just a handful of kind of uh, questions that I've, uh, random questions that I've kind of come up with during the interview that I'd like to go over before we get into the book. Yeah, absolutely. Um, how many uh, total F-18 pilots are there that are ready to to fight a war at any given time ballpark? I know you don't know the exact number, but. Man, I, that's a really good question. Um I don't know. I and don't it, know the answer to that. that. And I'm assuming that doesn't match plane for plane. There's more planes Correct. than there are pilots. But yeah. Each well, there's actually more pilots than planes. Really? Yeah. Um, each squadron has about um, about thirty. Well, hold on a second. Uh, I'm thinking about the reserve squadron is, has more pilots because we have reservists that. Um, so our, our numbers tend to be a bit bigger, but uh, there's definitely. Um, at least 20 pilots in an active duty squadron and uh, like I said maybe 10 planes um, so how many squadrons are there um, I don't you know I don't know how many there are but there's probably 
I would say 20 squadrons. Yeah. So there's a, a few hundred. Yeah. I mean, um, and those are the ones who are actively flying. And then obviously you've got a bunch that are on staffs and places and different phases of their career and yeah. um, doing other jobs. But I, I mean, I'd say a good number is probably like 2,000. You know, Actual total. pilots. Yeah. yeah. And, and that's just for F-18s? Yeah, just for F-18s, yeah. So would you say that 16s, 15s, 35s, 22s are all pretty similar? There's about 2,000 of each, or, or are there more of one than another? Yeah, I mean, I, I I don't even know about the Air Force and what their numbers are, but, uh, um, I mean, the Air Force obviously has more uh, more squadrons, more pilots, more jets than the yeah. Navy does. Yeah. So I guess in cocktail napkin math, I mean, would it <laughs> suffice to say? I told say, you I don't do math. Yeah. <laughs> well, fuck, you're better than, at it than I am for sure, but... You know, just from kind of a 30,000 foot view standpoint, does our country have several thousand ready to ready to go yeah. combat aircraft? Yeah, we do. Okay. We do. And and the ones that retired too, that we, we um, fly them to Davis Mothin and there's uh, like, I've flown a couple F-18s there, uh, put them in mothball and they're kept in a state of readiness so that they could be pulled out and, yeah. and put back operational. So. Yeah. Okay. Um how many 20 mic mic rounds are typically carried on an F-18? About 500. Really? Yeah. I mean, you can go through that pretty fucking quick, right? <laughs> yeah, like, like in seconds. Yeah. Um, do you know about how how much 500 20 millimeter rounds weighs? I mean, is that uh, what's holding no. them back? Is it space or weight or both? Or No, uh, it, it's just space. Yeah. Yeah, because, you know, every, every spot of that plane is um, jammed with something. And the gun is in the nose, so it's forward of the cockpit. Oh, okay. um, and so that's where all the rounds are kept. Okay. I don't know if you can answer this or not. Uh, does the F-18 or any other fighter jet have a nuke cap carrying capability? Yeah, uh, the F-18 used to. I mean, um, there was a switch in the cockpit that was called a nuke enable switch. Um, and it didn't do anything, at least when I got to it. But they did train. They used to train to deliver nukes. Um, Later on, they ended up rewiring the switch to actually take uh, raw video from our targeting pod instead of, because we used to have these cameras that would sit on the canopy and, and record the screen. And so the, the resolution was so poor for, for battle damage assessment and stuff. And so the nuke enable switch would actually record from the back of the screen so you'd see the raw video. Mm. Um, so that was what the, that's what we used it for. But uh, now I think the nuke capability is strictly like B-52s, B-1s, you know, okay. the strategic air command stuff. Yeah. Um, on the air to air missiles, the sidewinders, the, you know, that ilk, I guess. Yeah. Um, if you're going fucking full speed, like how mm -hmm. fast are they going? Oh, even faster. I mean, obviously yeah. but like, like Mach four. No know. shit. Yeah. Man, that's fucking crazy. That, I mean, that, that's hard to even wrap your fucking mind around. Yeah. Um, when you, uh, drop, either, you know, the thousand or two thousand pounders or even something as small as, as a air to air missile. Um, is it kind of like hitting a fucking speed bump in a car? Like it, does you, it, you feel it. Yeah. When you drop, especially like, you know, the 500 pounders, you know, a thousand pounders or whatever, uh, you actually feel your, your jet get light yeah. and, and kind of go up a little bit. Yeah. Like jumping in an yeah. elevator. Yeah. The missile is not so much. I mean, yeah. they're, they're pretty, they're pretty light, just a couple hundred pounds. And so, yeah. The air-to-air -air missiles, are they loud when you shoot them off? Or? Uh, no, you might hear a whoosh, maybe. Yeah, not uh, much. No. Yeah. Have you ever been in a in an actual dogfight? No. No, no. I think the F-18, we've had, I think, maybe like three kills, you know, in the history of the plane. Yeah. Two of them were in Desert Storm, and you know, yeah. one was recently. Yeah. Um, all right, so this is uh, going to be a, a clip or a short for sure. What What is the F-18 Survival Kit EDC? <laughs> Um, okay, so um, your seat pan has some basic stuff in it, but most of it's related to survival in the water. So you've got a survival uh, raft. Um, you've got your emergency oxygen that you breathe when you eject. Um, so everything else is really what you carry on you in a survival vest. Um, so we have a survival radio, um, day-night flares, pencil flares, uh, knife, you know, compass, just the basic stuff. Is that shit that you pick or that you're issued? You're issued that. And then you're given uh, a limit. You can you can have, I can't remember what it is, like maybe 10, 10 pounds of personal, you know, uh, equipment that you choose. So when I flew my first deployment, uh, my, my parents gave me a handheld GPS because we didn't have GPS back then. Um, and so they gave me a handheld GPS so I could, if I got shot down, I could 
actually navigate somewhere, you know, without using a compass and the stars. Um, and uh, in combat, you fly with a pistol. We carry a, I think it was a SIG uh, P226, I think. Um, we carry a couple uh, spare magazines. Um, we had a, a evasion charts, you know, which very high definition charts, very, very useful. And then um, we carry what was called blood chits. Um, has an American flag on it in different languages based on where you are. It'll say, you know, I'm an American. You know, my country will, you know, reward you if you help me. And you can tear off a corner and hand it to somebody. And theoretically, they can turn that in and get two goats or whatever. Um, and so, yeah, we were just jamming stuff everywhere, you know, in combat. Um, but, yeah, normally it's it's just the basics. The What was the knife that you carried? Um, they, let's see, we had, we've gone through several different versions, but... Um, uh, it was, there were folding knives. Um, I think it was a SOG. I think it was a little, so you didn't have the 1985 Rambo for yeah, no, survival knife no. with the compass cap. And no, I did have a fixed blade SOG that was, I, yeah. I attached my, uh, gear for, um, my personal yeah. gear. Yeah. What, uh, did you bring anything else on top of that? Uh, like your 10 pounds of whatever you, yeah. Can I mean, use? usually it was just like water and, you know, other stuff that I might snack. Yeah. 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 Um, that's good stuff. Uh, all right. Drone fighters, uh, whether it's actually using drones as kind of attack aircraft, which we already kind of do, yeah. not kind of do, we already do. Yep. Do you foresee a Terminator two style fucking drone? Yeah. Like jet fighter or fighter jet, uh, in the future? You know, I mean, I think that's the direction they want to go. Um, I, I personally don't think so, and I, I, for a couple of reasons. One, I think um, uh, I think once you take the human element out of combat, then then war becomes an easier decision. You know, like if if you can, uh, if you're the president of the United States and you can respond to some incident uh, without risking American lives, why wouldn't you do that? As opposed to let's try to handle this diplomatically in a peaceful way, and so. Uh, when you do that, war becomes not a big deterrent anymore. Um, so I don't think so. At least I hope not. But I was going to say, like, I, I, I agree yeah. uh, that it's not a good idea. That for fuck sure doesn't mean that it right. won't happen. Right. Um, but <clears throat> what I do see happening, and I think this would be a good idea, is to have um, what we would call like maybe sacrificial you know, drones, um, like, a, like maybe an unmanned wingman, for instance. So I could have another plane that... Um, uh, will carry a ton of missiles, right? And he's responding to my commands. Mm. So, uh, hey, I can only carry so many missiles on my jet, but I can use all his first. Yeah. And uh, and 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 if if I'm being attacked, um, I can use him as a decoy. I can use him. I can sacrifice him by crashing him into a, another jet. Um, if uh, he's, you know, uh, used up all his missiles, I can take his fuel. Maybe like he can just pass me his fuel. And, uh, and then he can crash in the water or whatever. It's like the puff, puff give of yeah, refueling. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, I, you know, I think that having that wingman might be kind of a cool thing, but you always, I think yeah. you have to have a human element, you know. Is the is the drone wingman something that you just think would be cool or, or have you heard of anything that, that there's actual? I do know that there's a, there is a drone uh, uh, aircraft that has flown off a carrier that they're, they've been using it to uh, do in-flight refueling. Oh, okay. Um, and then that's in the, obviously the testing phase and um, yeah. or development. But as far as the, the wingman goes, I don't think I've, I've heard anything specifically about it. Yeah. Uh, what was the average elevation of uh, the JTAC combat drops that you did in Iraq on that first deployment where you were just bombing the shit out of everything? Like the elevation, like where, where I was? Yeah. Um, it varied. I mean, I was... Um, there was a couple times up in the mountains, like right on the border with Iran, uh, where, where I, I dropped a couple GPS guided weapons, didn't even see them hit because they went through clouds, but the JTAC was on the ground, you know, and, and, and radio back and then somewhere on the desert floor. Um, so, uh, it definitely varied lowest and highest. Um, I don't know, maybe call it a thousand feet to, uh, you know, I don't know, like 3000 meters or something like that. Okay. So when the the thousand feet, I mean, are you able to to see where it hits and 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 actually gauge like any type of battle damage assessment or with our well, 
Okay, so those are the those are the target elevations. I was dropping from you know thirty thousand feet, so everything that I would see would be through my targeting pod. Okay. Um, the F eighteen targeting pod on that deployment was uh, we used what was called the Nighthawk FLIR. It was very poor resolution. In fact, the uh, the F fourteens carried the Lantern pod, which had a much better resolution. So oftentimes we would use the F fourteen to get battle damage assessment for us because you know like if I would just bomb a tank, which I bombed several. Uh, it would just be a glowing dot basically yeah. on my display. So by the time it hits, like you're so far gone that like, and no, even in the, yeah, we would stick around always and watch it. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, there was uh, one mission I was carrying what was called the joint standoff weapon. Um, it's this uh, uh, weapon that you, you drop like a bomb, little wings pop out and it glides to the target. And then when it, when it, it got, it's guided by GPS. And when it gets there, there's different types. Some, have little bomb bays open up, little bomblets fall out. So it's like a cluster of munitions. Um, and uh, at the time, uh, Iraq had this uh, missile engagement zone all through the central part of the country where um, uh, they were in service to the air missile sites like SA-2s and SA-3s that were targeting coalition aircraft. And so they told me they wanted me to drop my JSAO on one of these sites, uh, but they wanted me to get battle damage assessment. I'm like... So you want me to use a standoff weapon so that I can hit a surface air missile site, but then you want me to fly over it to get video. Like, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Whose yeah. idea yeah, was it? It makes perfect sense. So uh, so we did that. We dropped it. There was, a, uh, they call them F-16 CJs. They were uh, basically anti-radiation. Uh, they had a bunch of high-speed anti-radiation missiles, and they would you know, be able to detect when service to air missile sites were targeting you and they would, they would be able to employ their, their missiles against those sites. So he went with us. Uh, it was me and my wingman and, um, I dropped the JSAO and I, you know, I'm, I'm just looking everywhere, making sure I don't see a missile coming up. And out of the corner of my eye, I see this uh, bloom, uh, kind of, uh, of light, like on the ground where my missile was going, where the missile site was. And, um, I immediately thought it was a missile launch. And so I told my wingman, heads up missile launch. And I kind of pull away and, He's like, dude, that was your JSAO blowing up. And I look on my screen, and sure enough, you can see all the bomblets. You know, oh, no shit. I just thought it was a missile launch, but it was actually the bomblets going off. Damn, that's wild. Yeah. Um, it, was there a? Uh, I guess before I ask you this, do you have any of any of your footage from any of your drops? Like, yeah, I've got some. Is, is that stuff you could share and we could put on YouTube? Uh, probably. Um, everything we have. Uh, so we used to make these cruise videos, yeah. you know, with the kind of best of, um, and that we all got it cleared. So nothing on there is classified, I think. Okay. Yeah. yeah I'd love to put that on the YouTube yeah. episode. I'll have to pull them up for sure. Yeah. Is there a single combat mission uh, that, that you went on where you dropped munitions that stands out as being the most memorable? Um, yeah. You know, just the, the just the ones where, um, you know, the, I could hear the I could hear the anxiety in the JTAC's voice. I could hear the gunfire in the background. Um, those are the ones that stuck out with me. And there's several of them, um, but um, it, you know, in the the ones where we used all our ammunition and we had nothing else, you know, it's kind of like, and okay, I need someone else here. You know, someone's got to help these guys out. Yeah. You know? Did you ever get any feedback from the guys on the ground of? Like, a, dude, you just fucking saved our ass. Like, was there, yeah. a, there was comments like that? Yeah, after? yeah there was a few. And they'd, they'd all get relayed through, you know, the uh, the carrier chain of command. And um, one of them in particular, uh, like I said, we were right on the border with Iran. And um, uh, we were, we were uh, dropping, I think it was OGA or something, because the guy was using straight up trucker comm on the radio. And um, uh, the admiral before this mission, he's like, I don't care if you fly into Iran, like you're going to help these guys out. And so, uh, we came back from that mission and, and you know, the admirals over one shoulder and the, the air wing commanders over the other and we're reviewing my tapes and I'm like, Oh man, I hope I didn't fuck this up. Yeah. You know, but, um, but yeah, those, then he came back and said, yeah, you, you know, we got word back. You guys did a good job. And yeah, yeah, yeah. that's awesome. Yeah. It's gotta be a, a strange feeling. I, I can only imagine having only been on the ground, but thinking of being like, Cause it's probably kind of quiet and almost peaceful up and like, mm -hmm. and knowing like the disparity between you yeah. and this like protected yeah. little bubble. And please don't take that as any disrespect. I, I don't at all. Um, but, but this like almost the, the, such a fucking contrast of like hearing what's going on in the ground, obviously knowing that you, you know, save probably hundreds, if not thousands of, of our troops lives with 
with the drops that you made, but that's got to be a strange yeah. disparity. Yeah, it, it is. Um, and, that, and that's one of those, that's one of the things that I think, um, at least myself and then the guys that felt like I did that flew that mission, um, we would do anything for the guys on the ground, yeah. you know, including uh, violating whatever rules, <laughs> to, you know, um, our, our Admiral uh, told us, you know, 10,000 feet was our minimum altitude at the beginning of the Iraq conflict. And um, guys would violate that all the time yeah. just to strafe. Do they, do they call that the hard deck? Yeah. They, yeah. yeah. yeah it's yeah, they, not just a Top Gun. Nope. Thing. It's not just yeah. the Top Gun yeah. thing. Um, yeah. I mean, I mean, guys would, uh, you know, hey, all I have left is, you know, the bullets in my nose and I'm going to use them. Yeah. And I don't care if I get yelled at, you know, yeah. I'm going to help out the guys on the ground. Is it purely a safety uh, measure to say to set a hard deck at 10,000 feet or yeah. what? For training, it is. For training, it's the idea is that you want to have enough airspace above the ground so that if you go out of control, you can recover okay. before crashing. Um, in combat, it was designed to uh, mitigate the risk of small arms fire or you know uh, man pads and yeah. um, things like that 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 you might not see or have the the radar uh, warning for. Yeah. Okay. Uh, do you know log or otherwise how many hours you've flown? Yeah, um, I do have a log. Uh, the Hornet, I have about twenty five hundred hours in, and then you know, you know, thousand hours in the T forty five, and I don't know how many Southwest hours I have. Yeah. All right, so that's a lot of hours to be yeah. flying, right? Yeah. So I have to ask, aliens, UFOs, <laughs> fucking shit that you don't know that you can't explain. Like, yeah. have you ever encountered in, in all the years? Because you've been flying a lot. Yeah, and. As, you know, in the last couple of years, there's been a, a shitload yeah. of things that have come out of footage from, you know, military aircraft, civilian aircraft, just with, with technology and and cameras and everything being what they are. Like, have yeah. you ever come across anything? That you're I like, have. Dude, what do you got to tell us? What yeah. Um, and so, first of all, I'll say um, I was one of those guys that sort of, you know, listened to those Navy pilots talk about aliens and stuff and be like, this fucking and you're guy. giving us bad name, you know. Um, but, uh, it was just a couple of years before I retired, I was flying a day air to air training mission with my wingmen over the Gulf of Mexico. So we took off out of new Orleans, uh, and we were just doing one V one dog fighting and, um, good weather, um, uh, daytime. And, uh, I, I, I'm pulling up, um, I'm looking up probably, you know, one or one or two o'clock out of the canopy at my wingman who is, who is pointed back towards my six o'clock. And, um, and I see something go right by the canopy. Right. And I, in, instinctively I duck thinking it's a bird or something. Uh, but I realize I'm way too high for a bird. So, so then my logical brain says, okay, it, this is uh, this is a glare off the canopy or something. So I'm gonna keep fighting. My wingman says, did you just see that? I'm like, I saw something. So he called it, knock it off. And a knock it off means the fight's over. And he goes, I'm going to chase it. And I was like, okay. So he, he goes back. Uh, I turn around. We have our radars out. We have our uh, uh, we have training missiles that are infrared um, scanning. Can't find it. We circled the whole area. Um, could not find anything. And so now I'm convinced, like, it's a weather balloon or something, right? Um, we go back to base, and we, we're, we're debriefing it, and, and I'm trying to debunk it the whole time. And we get the models out, and we're, we're, okay, we're like this, and we're moving this fast, and something's, you know, and he's like, dude, this thing went by your jet, turned and followed you. And I was like, wait, what? <laughs> I'm like, I didn't know that part. So is that on radar? Uh, no, that was just with his eyes. Oh, okay. Yeah. I um, mean, do you guys have the, the equivalent of dash cams? Uh, we do. We don't always turn them on. In fact, uh, nine times out of ten in the reserves, we wouldn't turn them on because it's just one more thing for us to carry and forget. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, we uh, – so we were talking about it and a guy in the squadron said, um, Hey, you know, one of my buddies works for O and I and, and they're trying to stand up this big thing at the Pentagon for trying to figure out what these things are. Um, there's a whole form you fill out where like, really, okay. So we, we go into the classified, we go to the skiff and, and get the form, fill it out, fill out all the information, send it off thinking like, I'm never going to hear from this again. Um, the next day we got a call from a guy at the Pentagon that was like heading up this whole, um, UAP program and he's like i want to give your squadron a classified brief and we're like really like, uh, my skipper came to me and said dude if i see little green men in this brief i'm gonna be so excited <laughs> um but uh yeah i mean it 
bottom line is they're trying to, um, they don't know what it is and they're trying to um, demystify it so that people aren't embarrassed about reporting it because, yeah. you know, we're the military. We need to be reporting this stuff. We need to find out what it is. Yeah. So there's no footage of this in, encounter, right? No, I have no footage yeah. of it. And from your wingman's uh, recollection is, is that it flew past you, turned around and followed you. Yeah. Um, how, how did, did he see more of it than you did? Yeah. He said he described it the same way I, I did, which is kind of like a white ball, um, maybe tic-tac shape, uh, which fits with some of the other uh, recollections. That's what I see was a white kind of spherical shape go by. Um, he said it was about two thirds the size of my jet. I, I don't recall it being that big. Um, so it could have been a perspective thing, yeah. but I just, you know, caught just a very quick blur go by. And none of it shows up on radar. Yeah. And we, we circled the whole area. Couldn't find anything. Dude, that's fucking wild. Yeah. So, I mean, what's your take on, on that? And, and do you know any other guys that you know well that have had strange encounters that have told you about them? A handful of people. Um, I've, I've run into a handful of people who have, whether it be military flying or civilian flying, that have seen things, usually lights that they can't, that are behaving strangely. Um, you know, it's it's definitely people are talking about it more, um, but it's something that interests me. And um, uh, ironically, kind of the beginning of my book, um, I based on an incident that took place off of Southern California where there were um, uh, lights that were swirling a Navy destroyer off the coast and the, and the FBI got involved and they're trying to figure out where these things came came from and, uh, were they commercial drones? You know, what were they? And um, so it got me thinking, like, what could it be? Personally, you know, could it be Little Green Man? Sure, you know, but I I like to think uh, that it's probably some hostile country that's doing something that's intelligence gathering related. Um, but then again, some of the ways they behave um, don't fit with physics. And Well, yeah, that's, that's the thing that, <laughs> You know, to me, like, it doesn't seem like any other country could possibly be right. that that advanced. Right. You know, I mean, if China is stealing stuff from us and Russia, yeah. I mean, maybe they could be more advanced, but not that much more advanced, right. you know. So, um, yeah, I mean, to me, it's, it's weird shit. And I agree, like, it seems like faux pas-wise or, you know, mystification, like, it, it's becoming less and less... Oh, look at this fucking kook, you right, know, right. because so many fucking people that, that otherwise, you know, that are, again, are pilots that yeah. are, you know, that aren't some dude living in a fucking trailer in, in, you know, the mid South or whatever that has three teeth and hopped up on fucking God knows what. It's like, yeah, I swear I got picked up by something. <laughs> You're like, yeah, okay, buddy. Yeah, sure you did. You know, but now there's like hundreds or, or at least dozens of people that yeah. it's like, dude's got his shit together. Yeah. You know, it's a military pilot, you know, whatever that are like, I can't fucking explain this. Yeah. Um, do you think it's, I mean, if you, if you had to, had to make a decision on it? Yeah, I mean, uh, my theory, and this would be not based on anything at all scientific, but, um, you know, we have area 51, right. And whether or not we have alien UFOs, whatever there, uh, it's reasonable to think that there might be other places around the world that do maybe in Russia, maybe in China. So maybe, um, they're using some of that technology. Uh, I don't. I don't think uh, we have aliens that are, you know, observing two F-18s fighting over the Gulf of Mexico. Yeah. Could it be alien tech that's flown by, you know, a hostile, you know, country? Sure. Um, personally, I think aliens, you know, might come by our our planet and lock the doors. You know what I'm saying? Like, like <laughs> yeah. driving through the wrong part of town. Yeah. Um, so, that's my that's my belief. I I will say that you know I can't say what was in the classified brief. It was nothing like super exciting, and probably more of it has been released in you know in Congress now, um, than than when I had that brief. But uh, there was a lot of stuff that it could not that could not be explained, and that was the bottom line. Is we don't know what it is. Yeah, man, that's fucking. Uh, there's there's a it's a weird mix of like it's kind of exciting and scary at yeah. the same fucking time. You know, like see, you know growing up in the '80s, saying like. Close Encounters of the Third Kind. I mean, and and granted, like I rewatched that movie f here fairly recently, and it's laughable. Yeah, that like how ridiculous the movie technology is. Like it's just stupid. You right, know, like right. you watch and you're like, holy fuck, how is this even a movie? But nowadays, uh, and then that's the other thing too that makes it difficult is that with AI and and CGI and everything mm -hmm. else, like the shit that people can can manufacture. Oh, yeah, video wise, like. I have no idea if that's real or not, right. you know, and, and, and 
pick something. I mean, it can be anything. It can be human beings doing things. It can be people yeah. who you know who they are, that that's not who they, you know, it's, it's made to look like a celebrity doing something that that's not even them. I mean, there's just, there's, there's so many things that. Yeah. You just can't trust your own eyes anymore. Yeah. Yeah. It's tricky shit. But, um, uh, were there any other, I, I know I, I kind of asked this already, but like other guys that you've known, have, have any of them shared stories uh, about any encounters like that, that, that are any different or, or anything that's worth mentioning? Yeah. I mean, no, uh, no personal recounts to me. I mean, the ones that I've, I've seen, you know, have, have uh, you know, pretty been well documented on the Joe Rogan podcast yeah, and stuff, yeah. and you know, yeah. But uh, I, but I have listened to those, um, to those retellings, and you know, very believable. Everything they say, um, it kind of fits with uh, at least what my experience and in, in, you know, kind of what I've learned. Yeah. Um, what it could be. Yeah. 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 Wild shit. Um, all right. So you get done fucking with the aliens, and then you come. Uh, you're working for Southwest. At what point did you decide you wanted to, to be an author? Yeah. Um, well, I always knew I wanted to write a book. Um, you know, growing up, I would spend a lot of times in libraries and bookstores. I mean, that, that was my toy store and candy store as a kid. Um, in the summertime, there was a, my parents would drop me off at a day camp and it was in the basement of a library and I'd sneak off and go up to the library and read about everything. I mean, aliens, read about uh, different uh, different planets, different uh, countries, um, fiction, nonfiction. Um, and so I've always read and, you know, even on deployment, um, you know, I always had a book. And I think it was on my JSOC deployment where I kind of said, you know, they exposed me to a world that I wanted to honor in some way. And not that I wanted to, you know, expose secrets or, or, or make it, uh, you know, tell stories, but, but the kind of people I worked with, you know, were so freaking impressive. Um, cause I remember thinking to myself, the greatest generation was my grandpa's generation. You know, the guys that fought the Nazis in Germany. Um, and I thought that was dead until I, I did that deployment and, and saw it alive and well, you know, at the lower ranks, like I said, the higher ranks, you know, might be political, but, um, I think today we have the men and women that would storm the beaches of Normandy if the, our, our leaders would let them. Yeah. I just don't think they would let them. So I wanted to honor that. Uh, part of that, part of that process um, is I wanted to write stories that kind of uh, uh, maybe rectified some of the mistakes that I saw some of our leaders make. So uh, you might be familiar with these programs um, like imminent fury was a yeah. light attack program uh, for NSW and uh they, they scrapped it, and then Combat Dragon 2 came up. It was a SOCOM pro program. Uh, it, in each case, Congress gets involved, and it becomes political. It's so like the Super Tucano uh, was a Brazilian-made plane, and, um, you know, whoever whoever the representative for, I don't know, was it Kansas, where they make the AT-6, they said, no, you can't buy the Super Tucano. You can't lease the Super Tucano. you uh, you got to have an American-made plane. And so that, you know, so it's, so forget the war fighters and what they need, right? We're just going to make it a political thing. So um, I came back from the JSOC deployment and uh, ran into another F-18 pilot at uh, VFC-12. Um, he was um, just like me, an adversary pilot, and we started talking about, uh, on that deployment I'd seen Combat Dragon 2, the OV-10 was flying um, downrange. I'm like, this is a really cool mission, dude. And he um, had heard about the Air Force light attack experiment and... Um, they were going to be testing the AT-6 and the Super Tucano, and they were going to figure out, you know, if we're going to, to go forward with this. So he volunteered to go be one of the pilots. And uh, sadly, he ended up crashing and dying in a Super Tucano, but, um, but he really believed in this mission. And, you know, for seeing it firsthand, I, I really believed in it too. And so I figured if Congress isn't going to fund it, I'm going to fund it through my books, you know. So, um so that's, that was kind of one of the things I wanted to write, you know, I wanted to get to that point where I could honor those people who are doing those kinds of missions and, and honor the, uh, the, the missions that I think, uh, we need to be doing and, and not just, uh, do things for political reasons. Yeah. So is that kind of where, where you developed the story for unknown writer is kind of tipping your cap to that, that principle? Yeah. Um, so unknown writer, um, you know, I wanted to expose people to, at first, you know, carrier aviation. Um, I think growing up, I read Stephen Kuntz, you know, Flight of the Intruder, and that was a really cool look at what life is like 
on a carrier flying combat missions, but that took place in Vietnam, you know, it was so long ago, so outdated. And the principles are still the same. I mean, honestly, I read, read that book just recently and, and I was like, yep, I remember, you know, being with those kinds of guys doing that kind of thing. Um, but I wanted to give a more modern look at it. So, um, so I wanted to tell a story that, that centered around carrier aviation. But the other thing I wanted to do was um, kind of expose the reader to kind of how nefarious um, some of the um, foreign countries do espionage. I mean, we do it the same way, right? But um, uh, in this book, the Chinese Ministry of State Security is the, the ultimate bad guy. And it all takes place in the United States. Um, and I challenge anybody to go to the New York Times website, type in Chinese espionage, and every day, I guarantee, every day there will be an article about a professor that was uh, tied to it, you know, somebody that's in industry, whether it be defense or otherwise, um, somebody somewhere in the United States is spying for the Chinese, and it's happening today, it's happening under our noses, and so um, that was kind of the premise of this book. It's like, okay, how can I take something that takes place on a carrier, but still have this espionage piece. And so, um, like I said, I started it with this whole, these orbs circling a ship off the coast of California. This uh, main character, Colt Bancroft, takes off and, uh, and goes after these orbs to investigate it. And then his jet stops responding to his commands and rolls in and points at the cruiser and is going to try to ram it. And he's freaking out, can't figure out what's happening. And uh, at the last second, recovers. And um, the Navy thinks he's screwed up, right? The Navy thinks, like, because that's what they do. You know, they think you screw up and we're going to take your wings away. And, and this is a, he's a Top Gun instructor. He's, uh, you know, got a ton of hours in the Joint Strike Fighter. And so he's an expert. He's like, no, I did not screw up. So he wants to clear his name. And that sort of uh, exposes him to this um, spy versus spy game that's going on with uh, trying to hunt down a Chinese spy that's on the carrier. And, and, uh, and kind of exposes this whole plot. Yeah, that's awesome. And so what number of book is this that you've written? This is one. This okay. is the first book in the series. Do you have a plan, like an overall plan for how many you, you want to do? Or? Yeah, it's a it's a four-book series. Uh, I'm going to uh, complete the whole series in that four, four books. Yeah. Um, I uh, uh, Book two is called Outlaw. Uh, it comes out in February. So, so Unknown Rider comes out November 21st. Uh, Outlaw comes out, I think, February 20th. Uh, the third book in the series is called Bogey Spades. I just finished writing it. That'll come out sometime, I think, next summer. Um, and then the last book is called Declared Hostile. And uh, each book has the military aviation side of it. Um, and I start to go more low-intensity conflict as well. Each, each book progresses where I bring in um, that whole light attack concept. Um, because uh, there was a squadron called VAL-4, the Black Ponies, they flew in Vietnam. They flew OB-10 supporting SEALs in the Mekong Delta. And um, uh, I wanted to bring that squadron back. Yeah, so. that's badass. Uh, any plans to do, I mean, it's a, it's a fascinating sounding series. Uh, any plans to try to adapt it for movie or series or anything like I, that? I would love to. You yeah. know, um, I do have a film agent and um, I know that... Uh, We'll, we'll see what happens yeah. so far. No one's come knocking, but yeah. uh, Tom Cruise is watching this. You know? Yeah, no shit. <laughs> well, yeah, so that was one of the things I had. Top Gun 1 versus Top Gun 2. Yeah. Uh, Top Gun 1 is a classic. Always will be. Top Gun 2 is amazing. The flying was authentic. Um, yeah, the visuals are fantastic. I, I watched it. Um, so it came out the day I retired from the Navy. Oh, really? Um, I watched it a week later and had a big grin on my face the, from start to finish. Yeah. yeah. One, one question I had, uh, plot. Plot hole wise, from my yeah. perspective, and in, in looking at it from a, a military tactics or strategy standpoint, um, to me, the, the entire mission didn't need to have been done. Right. Like, based on you, you could have bombed, like, there's no reason to fly that. You could Correct. have bombed that, right? Yeah. Okay. Absolutely. And yeah, I mean, and if you're going to use uh, Tomahawk missiles to take out a runway, why not use them to take out the surface to air yeah. sites? Yeah. I, so. I mean, I was thinking the same thing. I was like, it can't be that glaringly obvious. Yeah. Like, am I fucking stupid or, or yeah. you know, but yeah, but it made for a great movie. Yeah. Uh, I was blown away at how good it was. Honestly, yeah. like I, I kind of thought that they'd fuck it up. Like, like too. most sequels do. Yeah. I mean, to me, it's every bit as good as the first one. Uh, I thought it was awesome, but, um, real quick, com air wise, yeah. uh, any insider, th uh, things that you can share that would surprise people or that, uh, you know, that, 
or out of the norm or just you're like <laughs> um <laughs> no i i I wish, you know, maybe it's because it's too common to me now. Um, I know I have a lot of passengers that always get on and be like, you know, is it going to be bumpy? And I honestly don't know. I mean, it could be crystal clear blue skies, not a cloud in sight, and it could be bumpy. Um, so the way I try to tell people is, um, you know, imagine the ocean. You have currents, you know. It's it's just water, but water moves. Air is the same way. Air moves. And so um, you, you could have currents. And so we will always try to find smooth air. Uh, if we have to climb, because sometimes you can climb above it or you can descend below it, um, we will always try to find smooth air. So whenever passengers are worried about the ride, I'm like, don't worry about it because yeah. the plane's not going to fall out of the sky. It's yeah. uncomfortable, but we're always going to try to find yeah. better. Which that, that uh, made me want to ask, uh, turbulence in an F-18, is it the same? No, it's not. Um, does it exist even? It does, but you know, you're know, you by yourself, so you don't really care, number one. Number two, the wings are lot shorter so you're a lot less susceptible to the, the up and down yeah so it's almost non-existent yeah i mean you can get tossed around pretty good um if you fly through really bad stuff and yeah uh, i've had friends struck by lightning before and, really yeah is it, uh what does that do uh sometimes nothing but uh one of my friends uh actually in new orleans got struck by lightning and he it messed him up pretty bad um he he actually had to kind of get talked into landing uh, on the runway um, man, managed to land. At, he tried once and had to go around. Was it a messed him up psychologically or messed him up physically? Physically. Oh, okay. Yeah, physically. He was like uh, completely out of it. They oh, wow. um, actually ambulance ended up meeting him on the runway and they had people that actually had to pull him out of the jet. And Anything permanent? No. No. Wow, that's fucking gnarly. Um, all right, the last thing I wanted to ask was the this here fairly recently, the crazy pilot that tried to hijack the yeah. fucking plane. Like, what? Do you know anything, anything about that? Uh, latest thing I heard was that he was um, he was having some psychological issues, uh, wasn't sleeping well, and had taken some magic magic mushrooms. Um, and what he, apparently what he told the other pilots was uh, was uh, you know like I haven't slept in four days, and and he reached for the fire suppression system handles, which actually shut the fuel down, you know, to the to the engines because he felt like it was in a dream and he wanted to wake up. Um, mm. And so when they, they said, you know, basically, like, what are you doing? Stop. Uh, he he kind of didn't resist. And they said, you need to leave. And he left on his own. So it wasn't like a big fight or anything. Yeah. He was just messed up. But I think, um, you know, it, it brings up a lot of issues. Um, you know, pilots, um, you know, they, they, they do a really good job of giving us programs that we can go to if you have substance abuse problems or if you have psychological problems, you know, and, and I think same with the veteran community, it, you just have to get through that stigma of, of talking, talking about it, Yeah, you know, but, uh, that's why there's two of us up there. You know, if I, if I fly with a guy and he's acting funny, I'm like, dude, are you okay? Like, have you ever had that happen? Um, not that bad, but you know, I've had guys that have had obviously have stuff on their minds. You know I mean? There's a ton of divorce in, uh, in, in the yeah. airline community and people are always dealing with something at home and, and you're like, dude, just call in sick, you know, Yeah, and there's no, don't no harm, no foul. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, what would you do if, like, you show up and your co-pilot, like, you can, you smell like he's fucking drunk? <laughs> this is an interview question, actually. Oh yeah. Yeah. They, um, they, they but what are you gonna do? And, um, basically, you want to handle it at the lowest level possible, right? So you meet uh, as a crew in the lobby of the hotel in the morning, and if you know, if I meet my co-pilot and he's smelling like alcohol, you're like, dude, call in sick, go back to your room, sleep it off, um, and what they want you to do is not let it progress further. And, you know, they'll say, no, I want to go. Okay. Uh, you, you keep trying to convince them, but the minute they uh, go through security, like they're going to go fly an airplane, that's when they've committed a crime. And, uh, and so you want to stop that if at all possible. So if, if it were me and I couldn't convince them just by bro, dude, just go back and sleep it off. Um, I would, uh, I would immediately call the chief pilot and say, I need to have him pulled. Yeah. You know, and I try to not tell him why, but you know, I need to have him pulled. And if it still progresses and you know, like, um, I'll, I'll tell him. Yeah. Yeah. I, I can only imagine that that's a tough spot. Like, you know, the guy that that's in that position, but it's like, fuck you, man, you fucking yeah. snitch. I, I'm not, I'm fine. Like right. you fucking narc, you know, like giving you shit for 
I'm, I can only assume most of them are probably going to handle it that way. I would imagine so. I mean, it's yeah. our, you know, personality. I think most, yeah. most pilots are type A and yeah. you know, no, I'm fine. I'm fine. Yeah. Have you ever had any close calls uh, in the air with unruly passengers doing weird shit or anything like that? Um, somebody had to be restrained. No, not really. I had, um, uh, I had one, uh, I had a flight attendant call up to the cockpit and say that a passenger uh, tried kissing a male pastor, tried kissing a female pastor that was, and, and she described her as a young girl. And, um, and, uh, they ended up moving him. Um, and I was like, yeah, this isn't going to fly. So, um, I called ahead and had law enforcement, you know, meet us at the gate and they came in and took the guy off. And, yeah. um, because I, you know, I've, I have a daughter and I'm obviously thinking like if my daughter's flying on an airplane, some, bozos you know drunk bozos trying to kiss her or something yeah. like you know yeah not on my watch yeah not on my watch <laughs> uh from an air marshal standpoint is there a lot of communication between you guys and them like uh, before the on, flight yeah yeah i mean so one of the jobs that i did um it's called federal flight deck officer they, they started after 9 11 where they train airline pilots with air marshals to carry a gun in the cockpit and so you're deputized um i did that for several years um and so any as somebody that would carry a gun in the cockpit um any well regardless uh, any law enforcement officer that, that's carrying um has to come identify themselves to us and then they have to know who else on the airplane has a gun um the uh, air marshals um are the one exception but they do have to introduce themselves to the captain um and um they would usually say Hey, I'm, and I'm here, um, no threats, you know, like, or sometimes they would say we're, you know, we're following somebody cause they'll, they'll be assigned flights to follow somebody that's on a watch list or something. Oh, really? Yeah. Th and they're not on every flight, right? Correct. Yeah. yeah. Is person, are they on half, most few? I think it, it, it depends on where, I mean, I'd say in and out of the Washington DC area, there's probably a lot more yeah. than in other places. You know, if you're flying, you know, in and out of Tulsa, probably not so much. Yeah. Uh, and you, you said your flight schedule is three on, four off? Uh, typically. And in that three days, I mean, is it like you're doing three, four flights in a day? or? Yeah, at Southwest, uh, we fly quite a bit. So our, you know, our days vary. Um, I could fly one leg in a day or I could fly five. Depending on length. Depending on length, yeah. yeah. And so what would, what would a three-day stint look like on average? Um, show up at the airport at uh, like 5 o'clock in the morning and – uh, fly, you know, three or four legs to get to wherever I'm going to overnight, uh, get there, you know, early afternoon, go to the hotel, you know, and you have anywhere from 12 to 20 hours at the hotel and then do the same thing the next day and, and you eventually work your way back to home. Yeah. And, uh, so in that three days you, you could do 15 flights. Oh yeah. Yeah. And is it, um, you start in Dallas Yeah. and you go everywhere or everywhere or is there like parts that you typically go to no i mean it's it's all over um you know like i uh i think my next trip i'm, I'm gonna overnight in phoenix and so i'm gonna go through i think chicago a few times uh the next weekend i know i overnight in LaGuardia downtown i'll be in downtown new york city uh one night uh maybe boston the next night um yeah. so i could be west coast east coast in the same trip different trips um sometimes international you know go down to mexico or the caribbean uh, Costa Rica is about the farthest I've gone. Um, I don't fly the, any of the Hawaii flights because you have to have a separate uh, qualification and there's only certain bases that get that qualification. Um, and they're all on the West coast. So yeah. is, um, is it the same crew? Like is your same co-pilot and same, same, the pilots are paired up, uh, for the same, uh, and sometimes they'll, uh, they'll reroute us. So for instance, my last trip, uh, I started in Austin uh, one day, flew to San Diego, and then was supposed to finish in Phoenix at 9.30 in the morning, um, and then have like 20 hours there. It was going to be great. That's what my first officer did when I got to San Diego. They said, we need you to fly to San Jose, and then we need you to fly to uh, Vegas, and then we'll fly you down to Phoenix and get in at 5 o'clock you know, at, at night. Yeah. Uh, so I had a different uh, first officer on, on those legs, and then I met up with the original the next day. So typically you're with the same co-pilot? Yeah. Like all the time? Yeah, for, for that trip. Okay. So for that, however long it is, two, three, four days, you're with the same guy. Um, it very rarely we'll have the same flight attendant crews. Um, usually we'll get uh, 
at least the same crew for a day, you yeah. know? Yeah. Do you ever, I mean, is there ever problems between, like, do you ever get a co-pilot? You're like, fuck this guy. Yeah, sometimes. I yeah. mean, I, I, I will say, um, in general, pilots are weird, yeah. you know? Yeah. Uh, and, and I'm an author too, and authors are weird. So it's like a double whammy. Double weird. So I, you know, I could be that guy that yeah. everyone says, um, yeah, he's a little weirdo, but, um, in general at Southwest, at least, um, uh, I really enjoy the people I work with. Yeah. I mean, I can count on one hand, the number of guys that I would never fly with again. Yeah. Um, it, and I mean, I've flown with hundreds. It, so if that happens, I mean, can you do that? Can you call and be like, dude, I don't, I'm not flying with this guy again. Yeah. We, <laughs> we have a. We have a thing called an avoidance bid. So every every month you bid for your schedule. And uh, as a first officer, so as a first officer, you could put down a captain who you do not want to be paired with. And so they will not award you a line with the same guy. Now, that doesn't mean you won't end up with him one day. And if that's the case, you can call out sick yeah. and um, and put it on somebody else. Uh, yeah. But there was only one person I ever put on my list. Yeah. I mean, is that why, I mean, I, I, can, I guess I'm asking, I'm, I'm assuming and asking, there seems to be a lot more flight delays nowadays. Mm -hmm. Like if too many people call in sick, I mean, is, is that no, is there a shortage? I, no, we have, um, we have a pretty robust um, a reserve system. So we, we have guys that are on call, you know, so for a 12 hour window a day, like you're on call. And uh, so typically most delays are for, our operation is a little bit different than most of the other majors. Um, so for like uh, American Delta United, they do what they call a hub and spoke. So they, they would fly from, let's say, Atlanta to somewhere and then back to Atlanta. And so if that weather in that one destination is bad, they just cancel that flight. And that, But the plane and the crew are still in Atlanta. They can do something else if needed. Southwest, we go point to point. So you might start, the plane might start on the East Coast in Baltimore and then fly to, let's say, Chicago and then go to Omaha and then go to Phoenix. If the weather is bad in Omaha, uh, you might get the plane, the plane and crew is stuck without being able to get to the West Coast where they need to be the next day. Okay. And so that's where a lot of the delays happen. So I know we had a big meltdown over Christmas because uh, weather in Chicago and weather in Denver kind of caused airplanes and crews to not be where they needed to be the next day. Oh, okay. And that messed everything up. Yeah. Have you had any super close calls? Uh, like like crashing, crashing white? No, uh, definitely not at Southwest uh, or in the civilian side of things. Uh, in the military, I've never felt like I was, I mean, I've lost engines. I've had to, you know, do emergency landings for, you know, gear wouldn't come down, things like that. But and nothing that I ever felt like yeah. I was going to die. But I also had an ejection seat, so. Yeah. I could just give the plane back to the taxpayers and pull the handle. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, any uh, weather patterns that like wind shears where you drop massive elevation uh, as a comm air pilot? Yeah. Uh, wind shear, um, we, we do, uh, we train for it every year, which is one of the nice things. Um, and uh, it, it's, I've been in wind shear and it, it behaves exactly the way the simulator does. So the training is perfect. Um can you explain what it is? Yeah, so it, wind shear basically just means there's a, a change in direction of the wind um, at a very abrupt spot. So, for instance, uh, you know that, maybe you don't know, and I'm going to tell you, but uh, the way an airplane stays in the air is the wing the, the wings act as uh, airfoil, so the air flows over the wing and underneath it, right, and it creates lift. And so at a certain uh, speed you're flying at, you have so much lift if that wind were to stop or it go from a headwind to a tailwind you know and it changes you know 40 knots or so uh, you could definitely drop um, and if it's you know if it's too abrupt um, it can cause a loss of lift to the point where you can stall the airplane and just it literally falls so when we when we are in those conditions we always add a buffer so we always fly faster than we want to so that we can account for that sudden drop in airspeed um, but, um, uh, you, you know, you, if you're in that situation, our procedure is for us to go around, uh, which means we don't continue to try to land and we try to go back up into the air where we're safe, things that aren't going to hit us and, and cause damage. Um, what, what's the, uh, it, I mean, maybe there's not an average, uh, the drop in elevation, like what, what's a, a uh, realistic amount? It, it, I mean, it, it definitely it definitely varies, but you know, a couple hundred feet, you know, maybe, um, depending on how severe it is. But 
Um, could it be severe enough where a wind shear would crash a plane? Yeah, and it has. It definitely has, which is why we have a lot more uh, procedures in place. Um, uh, for, there's a story that's told pretty famously for us. It took place in New Orleans where, um, you know, they, they uh, this one crew took the runway and, and looked down at the end of the runway and saw this storm cell right at the end and, and said, yeah, we're not going to take off. And they taxied off. And the next plane said, yeah, we'll go. They took the runway, they took off, flew right into the storm, and the wind shear um, just pushed them right into the ground and uh, crashed, killed everybody on board. Damn, when was that? Um, I can't remember. That must have been like in the 80s or something. Uh, it was a long time ago. Um, but now when we're in that kind of weather, we're told that, you know, we take the runway, we allow our weather radar to, to sweep, and our weather radar is sensitive enough to detect wind shear. And uh, it's one of the few things that we will do a high-speed abort on the runway for. Um so if we, um, it, you know, the things that we say that we will abort for at high speed are like the, if we have any kind of uh, fire, uh, whether it be an engine or a cargo bay fire, um, if we have the engine failure, um, if, uh, if we have wind shear or the aircraft just can't fly for whatever reason, uh, everything else will, will take in the air. Yeah. Okay. Uh, if you take it in the air that way, like I'm assuming the crashing is when you're pretty close to the ground yeah. to begin with. Yeah, absolutely. If you're at. 30,000 feet, like it's not going to crash. It may right. scare the shit out right, of you. Right, exactly. And that's where you'll see the pictures of, you know, um, you know, the uh, drink carts turned upside down and, you know, bags everywhere. And Yeah, yeah, yeah. okay. Um, what am I not asking that uh, people would find interesting or fascinating about uh, the com air industry? Uh, yeah. Um, yeah, I, you know, I, I don't know. It's um, It's a great profession. Um, I wish that more people did it. Um, you know, we, we have a lot of um, young kids that will come up and, and visit and uh, I always say, are you going to be a pilot? I'm like, oh, I could never do this. Yeah. I'm like, are you kidding me? I've, I've seen the way you kids play video games. Yeah. Like, I know you could do this. Yeah. Um, so I, it's something that I wish that more kids found fascinating and, and I don't know I don't know why because it really for me growing up, you know, we had Top Gun and yeah. um, aviation was really cool. Yeah. Is it, um, I mean, I don't want to get too, too into your shit about personal finance or whatever, but it seems like it's a pretty good paying job. It's a good profession. Yeah. Um, well, it's fascinating shit. Um, Unknown Writer is the first book. It comes out uh, when? November 21st. November 21st. And it sounds like the subsequent three are within a year after that, right? Yeah. It's a pretty quick turnaround. Yeah, it's going to be real quick. Yeah. Um, well, I can't thank you enough for coming. Uh, I th can't thank you enough for your service. I mean, you've yeah, done likewise. so much for this country and, uh, and I, I'll speak on behalf of everybody. We appreciate you. So, uh, I appreciate you coming and, and sharing your story and, and everything that you've done. And, uh, oh, I do have uh, a parting gift. Oh yeah. Almost forgot. See, especially, uh, do you have a favorite color? A favorite color? Yeah. No. <laughs> uh, so everybody gets uh, gets this parting gift here on oh man on mic drop, especially you being here in Texas. You got man, the, that's awesome. On the on the back side of the coin is the is the mic drop logo, and yeah. then in the box, if you wouldn't mind opening uh, showing the camera, this oh, is from uh, John Johnson and the oh. Champion Choice Silver. So man, that's so cool. Good uh, good to go here in Texas. So uh, yeah, get I've got, your I've got a perfect on. perfect belt for it. Awesome, awesome. Yeah. Well, thank you again for coming. Uh, for you guys, I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, maybe we can get some more alien stories out of <laughs> out of somebody. But uh, I appreciate everything that you do. Hope you enjoyed it. If you didn't, go choke yourself. And until next time, this is Mike Drop.